Hello, good morning, and welcome to Film EU Future Visions, the first pre congress of the 8th International Congress of Audiovisual Researchers. My name is Barry Dignam, and I'm the head of European projects at the National Film School at IADT in Ireland, and a member of Film EU's management board. The theme of the main congress is to develop understanding of the paradigm shift set in motion by information and communication technologies and the production of digital content. I'd like to think that in keeping with that theme, today we look at the parallel shift in higher education that the European Universities Initiative ushers in, and in particular in the area of film and media arts that Film EU hope to chart the way. So who are we? We're Film EU. We're one of 41 alliances set up to shape the vision of what the university of the future will look like. Our main objective is to implement a European University of Excellence focused in the fields of film and media arts. Our visual vision implies that Film EU will exist as an exemplary collaborative structure, able to deepen existing cooperation between us and foster our ability to act in the cultural and creative industries and across other societal areas they impact. Film plus EU, Film EU. But for us, the whole is much greater than the sum of its parts. The partners are Lusophona from Portugal, the National Film School at IADT from Ireland, Luca from Belgium, and SFA from Hungary. This isn't a new relationship. We're building on more than a decade of successful cooperation. We see ourselves collectively as key players in driving education, innovation, and research within the European higher education area, and in promoting the central role that the creative and cultural industries can and should have in our societies. Throughout the day, we'll cover some of the areas of intervention, a taster, if you wish. We'll talk about a response to the new European Bauhaus initiative, future storytelling, new pedagogies and new forms of creative narrative, best practices in artistic research, methods and challenges in teaching transversal projects. Then we'll have some lunch. After that, we'll have a round table on visualizing the impossible. And finally, a session on measuring the impact of cinema sound effects on audience in, key certain, in certain key paradigms. Of course, today we're restricted to meeting virtually. So the speakers have been asked to keep the presentation short, but that means that you have a job. You should post questions during the talk via live chat, and we'll have a Q&A after each speaker. So please don't be shy. So let's kick off with our first presentation, which is a response to the new European Bauhaus initiative. It's about the Bauhaus of the seas, a more than human approach. Mariana Pestana from Lusophona will present. Mariana is an architect and independent curator interested in critical social practice and the role of fiction in design for an age marked by technological progress and ecological crisis. She's a member of the collective The Decorators and an interdisciplinary practice, so an interdisciplinary practice that makes collaborative public realm interventions and cultural programs. She recently co-curated the exhibitions The Future Starts Here, the VNA, and Eco Visionaries Art and Architecture after the Anthropocene at Mass, Matadero, and the Royal Academy. She gained a PhD in architecture from the Bartlett School of Architecture, and previously she worked as a curator at the V&A Museum and lectured at Central St. Martins. So I'll hand over to Mariana. Thank you, Barry, and for the introduction. Um, and, and thanks for the invitation to be here today. Um, I'm going to share my presentation with you. Um, so just give me a second and now you should be able to watch um, my screen so um, I'd like to to tell you about um, uh, 
the Bauhaus of the Seas, which is um, a manifesto um, that I co-wrote uh, together with Nuno Jardim Nunes, Heitor Alvelos, Miguel Figueira and Frederic Duarte, um, uh, as a response to the, to the EU um, initiative of the, new, the so-called New European Bauhaus. Uh, but um, I'll um, give you a little introduction as to how um, uh, I positioned myself um, and, um, and how I came to, to take that position in the manifesto. Um, so um, despite living in a serious and undeniable climate crisis, we are unable or seem unable to imagine the world otherwise. Um, our ideas of comfort and progress seem to be incompatible with the necessary changes that we need to make in order to overcome this crisis that we're living in. Um, and this will be my, my this is my main point. Um, uh, how may we reset our ideas of comfort, of progress, of development um, in order to ensure an equitable future for humanity? What's at stake, I believe, is a cultural transformation. Um, one that puts values such as care and affect at the forefront. Our relationship to nature today um, is opportunistic, instrumental, extractive. Uh, we treat nature as matter to be used and serve our purposes, forgetting that resources are limited and that piercing, drilling, breaking the earth has dramatic consequences um, such as the exhaustion of those resources in the first place, but also the unbalancing of ecosystems. This is the flag, um, a virtual simulation of Spindletop Hill in south southeastern Texas in the United States, where a booming oil industry once existed and grew, and many of the major oil companies such as um, uh, Exxon, for example, or Texaco, uh, they can trace their origins there. In one day, um, this site produced more oil than the rest of the world's oil fields combined um, at the same time. But today, these, the oil deposits here are exhausted. And it is this deserted landscape that, um, of Spindletop that makes the background to John Gerard's work, Western Flag, which is what you see now in the image. On the landscape, the artist places a flag of perpetually renewing pressurized black smoke. And it provides us with a vision of the Western unconscious, because despite knowing that fossil fuel is finite, the so-called developed world continues to exploit it as if there was no end. It is estimated that at the current rate, 20% of the planet's species will have disappeared by 2030. A 2019 Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change Global Report has shown that nature is declining globally at rates unprecedented in human history, stating that around 1 million animal and plant species are now threatened with extinction. I'm sure you've seen this in the news. Um, what this means is that in the coming decades, societies will have to face changes to the state of the planet for which they are not culturally or biologically adapted. This is a digital simulation of Sudan, the last male northern white rhinoceros created by artist Daisy Ginsberg in collaboration with DeepMind, the AI um, company. She made a digital replica of the rhino when it became extinct in 2018 and called it the substitute. To explore a paradox, our preoccupation with creating new life forms through AI, for example, while neglecting existing ones. In order for our species to guarantee its future, its future survival, I believe two key ideas are fundamental. One is coexistence. We are part of complex geopolitical networks that interlink northern, southern hemispheres and more. And key to a new cultural paradigm is a critical understanding of progress and development and at what cost it is produced. This is a project by Delia de Emo called Cosmogonies of Racial Capitalism, which shows how the sugarcane plantations in the island of Madeira have propelled the birth of global capitalism and transformed notions of race in the process. He proposes a new kind of cartography that overlaps European and African viewpoints. 
In order to survive in the future, we must design for ecosystems, not for individual clients. This is a drawing of an architectural project now built in Texas. We showed it at the exhibition Eco Visionaries that Barry introduced in Lisbon. Um, the house is equipped with a filtering device that cleans the water of the lake in which it is situated, contributing to the well-being of the ecosystem. So despite the client being, of course, a human being, um, the, the building benefits um, the larger ecosystem in which that um, person is situated. We used to think of humanity as something defined in opposition to nature. Reason and soul divided us from the rest of the world. But the Anthropocene, this um, so-called Anthropocene, right, the new geological epoch, has made us aware of the extent to which Earth and humans are interdependent. To survive, our species will have to adapt to the environment that it transformed. If we have designed our own possible extinction, can we design our way out of it? I think so, but we will have to reassess our notions of comfort and progress. For the Istanbul Design Biennial, which I've um, curated um, this year, we have equipped a gastronomy school with a solar kitchen, a high school with a family of food preservation devices using burial, drying and smoking methods. I believe that progress is not a linear path that we may have to look backwards in order to have a different future horizon. Oh, sorry. We are in face of a new design paradigm, the idea of designing for the more than human, considering the people, the landscapes, the many species that are impacted by design. And so I've called these designs for more than one. So design practices that consider more than one perspective, more than one body, more than one uh, dimension. And it was this with this more than human agenda and a desire for decentering the human from the design equation that I co-wrote this vision for the new European Bauhaus called Bauhaus of the Seas. And as I mentioned earlier, um, I co-wrote it um, together with the Nun Jardin Nun, Frederic Duarte, Tural Velos, and Miguel Figueira. And so I'll just take you through some, some of our key ideas. Um, we all know that the oceans are a precious ecological device, um, that, it, that the oceans store most of the CO2 that we produce. They are a condition shared by many European cities. So our proposal is a cohesive one, and it gathers together four European regions. Our proposal wants to reconcile with the seas, not explore the seas. It wants to reconnect with communities and learn from the bottom up, involving citizens in imagining and rehearsing alternative, truly ecological possibilities for design. It is an interdisciplinary endeavor to imagine different futures. So we imagine it as a traveling laboratory of ideas, a testing ground to experiment with more than human design, where design is a form of interspecies diplomacy, where our relation to nature is not extractive, but is instead empathic. Um, it's a school because it wants to draw a new paradigm for design that inspires future generations to create architectures, objects, situations um, and designs that privilege the well-being of more than one. So it is this collective interspecies ecological vision for design that we are putting forward. Um, so you can visit the, the our manifesto here and, and read about it in more detail. Um, uh, as I end, I just wanted to, to remind you of um, uh, the thinking of, of neuroscientist Antonio Damasio, since we are broadcasting from, from Portugal, because post-Enlightenment histories of evolution have um, normally focused on rational achievements and disregarded the role of affect and feelings. Uh, but neuroscientist um, Damasio 
uh, puts it in a really beautiful way, says that reason and intelligence's purpose is care, that caring is a fundamental aspect of survival, because feelings are what guides homeostasis, the necessary balance between any entity and its environment in order for it to thrive into the future. So um, it is with this caring um, responsibility that um, I at least um, uh, position myself in relation to this new European Bauhaus movement. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mariana. I hope I'm live again. Um, one of the things that I forgot to mention at the very beginning is that uh, the wonders of technology, while we're live, we're live slightly ahead of time. Um, so people who are viewing on the YouTube channel are slightly behind us. So I'd say to anyone, if you've got questions, make sure you put them in during the, the chat or we won't get them for a few minutes after the chat ends. I'll kick off though, Mariana. I'm gonna send you the first co-design event of the Biohouse of the Seas at Matt in Lisbon. Can you share some findings about the discussions that take, took place in that context? Of course. So um, yes, we had um, uh, last month, we did a, a first co-design event um, here in Lisbon. Uh, and it was really the beginning of um, uh, of the discussion. So we we wrote this manifesto um, really as a as a kickoff, right, uh, to begin what is a collaborative conversation um, and an interdisciplinary conversation as well. And at Matt, uh, we have invited many of the partners that are forming um, uh, together with us uh, the Bauhaus of the Seas Initiative. Um, but we've also invited thinkers, um, you know, across uh, um, different fields and practitioners to um, share with us what their main preoccupations are and how they imagine the, um, uh, the future of, of design um, practice, but also pedagogy. And uh, perhaps what I could say about that, uh, uh, those first conversations uh, is that there was a, um, a big focus on complexity as something that must be taken into consideration and not disregarded right that um, uh, the, the climate crisis in relation to technological development and even the seas the fact that we know so little of the seas in fact you know um, right now in this moment in time uh, makes it that we have to approach the subject uh, with complexity and um, and so how do we do that and so uh, some some of the the people we've invited have shared with us um, how they are tackling complexity for example by thinking across scales and um, and across um, uh, geographies so um, by looking at uh, the tiniest scale <laughs> And at the territorial scale as well, um, we might uh, be able to understand um, the seas in a better way, um, but also by including um, uh, political or geopolitical narratives into um, into these um, these conversations. And how do we do that? So. Uh, there was a lot of conversation around cartographies, for example. So the fact that we, um, the cartographies that we have now at our disposal are quite limiting in terms of what is represented and what we can see. Um, and so people like, for example, Delia Diemo or even Andres Jacques, um, whose work I've shown you today, they are experimenting, um, not just as practitioners, but also in their school environments, right, as, um, uh, as lecturers and, and running um, design studios at Columbia and, um, um, and the RCA, respectively. They are also exploring this with students. How do you uh, embrace complexity and what new cartographies, what new ways of representing the world can come out of, of that approach? And so um, by looking at the world differently, then we can operate differently. That's that's how they think. So that was one um, uh, one of the findings, for example, was that if we are imagining a new, um, um, let's say, a new learning environment, a new design school, let's say, whether that's a physical thing or, or, or something in movement, um, that um, we should really tackle these these two dimensions. 
Yeah, I think it's it's really fascinating the idea of it of it of something being there, a school being on the seas, but also the the the, the not exploring in a way. I thought that 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 resonated with me. It, it, all our it seems to me that all all our history is about being exploring to consume, exploring to exploit, um, and to to change that that kind of paradigm in our heads is 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 a really interesting thing. Yeah, no, that's really, um, I think that's really important. And it's a challenge as well, because, um, uh, yeah, as you, as you rightly say, it's, um, it's almost like in, it's almost in our DNA, right? Because this history of, um, of, uh, exploitation, in a sense, the, um, I think, uh, this narrative or, or a way of thinking of looking at, uh, matter as a resource um, is has been around for a long time. So how do we change that paradigm? Um, but I think that um, nowadays we see that a lot of not just philosophers, but also practitioners, educators and um, and thinkers across the world are um, uh, developing work to challenge that paradigm because it's it's really that we just cannot continue in that way. Um, because we will exhaust our, our resources. So uh, our, our approach is one perhaps that um, begins with without and care, right? So um, the, the knowledge of the oceans is still quite limited. So how do we even engage with, with that unknown? And how do we do it in a way that doesn't harm um, uh, the environment that, that we may be researching or, or looking at in the first place? Um, uh, and we believe that uh, the seas um, in their complexity, I mean, uh, the different regions that are engaged in the project, they, they, they have very different relationships with the sea, right, that pose different questions. So we have an Atlantic coast, for example, but um, Italy, for example, who is a partner, uh, has all the Mediterranean, um, uh, but a much more direct contact with the Mediterranean basin, which poses other kinds of um, challenges that have to do with migration, for example. Um, whereas, um, say, the Netherlands, for example, have a much more industrialized um, relationship with, with the seas. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I believe that there's a lot to be learned, um, especially by crossing um, these different forms of knowledge. And I'd say that something that's really um, quite unique about our initiative is that um, it joins together um, academic institutions um, uh, ac across the different regions, but also cultural institutions. And so we really want to make a dialogue between um, university contexts, design studios, of course, but then also um, museums and cultural centers um, as um, not just as recipients of work, but as active, um, 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 active uh, with an active role of uh, in shaping the project too. Right, and and hopefully, Phil, me, you can be a can be a part of that. Yeah, uh, hopefully. Mariana, yes, you know, I please. hope so. Thank you so much. That was really really interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you, thank you for a that. Pleasure. Thank, thank you so much for your questions. Uh, now we're going to move on. Um, uh, to future storytelling, uh, new pedagogies and new forms of creative narrative by Ronan and Myrtle from IADT. Ronan is head of faculty of film, arts and creative technology, which is a student cohort. He's also my boss, let me just say that, which is a cohort of over 1600 full-time and part-time students. He's responsible for all aspects of academic quality and delivery. He's an active practitioner also. His credits include all the genres of TV, high-end, award-winning documentary films, international formats, and some of the best known and loved Irish primetime programs. He's a multi-Irish film and television Academy Award winner and a member of the Film EU Management Board. Take it away, Roma. And you're muted. Yeah, yeah. I'll just share my screen now. Hopefully you should all see that. Yeah, we've got that. It's not changing screen. The changing screen there? Uh, yeah, perfect. Yeah, great. Oh, thanks, Barry. Um, when I was a newly appointed head of department some years ago, um, I attended an end of year program board. These are the mini staff student councils that help to run programs in IDT animation in this case. And one bright, talented, and precocious final year student, in her feedback to all present, asked pointedly, 
What exactly can I learn from this program that I can't learn from a YouTube video? This question has gnawed at me ever since. As an educator, I should know the answer to this question instinctively. Young people are digital natives, apparently, which is just a way for a middle-aged man like me to feel okay about the fact that younger people are just better at technology than I am, perhaps we are. They come to us with many of the skills and knowledge that we lack, but they are all individuals and different, and we can't make assumptions. What we can give them is, I would argue here, however vital to their success, context, critical awareness, a safe and supported space to learn, challenges that increasingly build their competencies and confidence, and the ability to access a world of opportunities and new knowledge. Not only do students have access to information and newer modes of independent learning, as technology changes, we need to keep reimagining how we approach teaching and learning. We can never hope to compete with all the forms of capturing and dissemination that could be explored as part of the degree program. Rather, what is argued here, that we must enable learners to teach themselves and each other to grow as practitioners in their chosen field and to become active, socially conscious citizens, reflecting what Mariana was talking about there. Ones that can comfortably use whatever narrative or indeed non-narrative form they choose for the common good. This, I will conclude, is the central philosophy of Phil Mayhew, and perhaps the answer I should have given to that animation student five years ago. Stories shape who we are. They allow us not just to entertain, but to construct meaning and knowledge. They are powerful tools that can be used to create empathy, address conflicts, and offer, well, often offer glimpses into the unknown. The changing nature of technologies and means of storytelling offers a vast and diverse narrative landscape to be explored. Narrative, as is quoted here, not only shapes our ways of communicating with each other and our ways of experiencing the world, but it also gives form to what we imagine, to our sense of what is possible. But of course, storytelling, as has been argued by the likes of educational psychologist Jerome Bruner, quoted here, dissected by Russian folklorist Vladimir Pop and others going back to Aristotle's poetics and indeed earlier into European oral traditions, is inimitable to all of us everywhere. Oral traditions such as the one represented in this one by illustrator Patrick Lynch tells the Irish myth of Niamh and Oisin, who fell in love, travelled to Tir the land of eternal youth, only for it all to go badly wrong. This tale is full of motifs common to all Indo-European countries, familiar to all of us. This tale, in its Irish form, is wrapped up in Irish Victorian foundation myths of Celticism, of whose culture only a trace in Ireland, can, well, the only trace we can find is the language, is wrapped up in heroic warrior poets and beautiful goddesses. These motif, motifs, the star-crossed lovers, is repeated, rinsed and repeated again and again in romance tales, plays, short stories, and even in movies, as awful as P.S. I love you. Their origins are old. We need only go back to the cave paintings of Chauveau Cave here, as we can see here from our early ancestors 36,000 years ago, who were trying to express ideas not only verbally, but also with pictures. Once, uh, one can only imagine the heroic tales that, were, uh, that these Im images evoked for the people painting. Whether men or women use natural ochres to paint on stone for the first time, to use celluloid and sound in film, and then the shift to digital, technology has always informed, shaped, and inspired how we tell stories. If we jump forward in time, Alfonso Cuaron knows this and is comfortable moving between high-tech boundary pushing films like Gravity and the far more understated and yet in ways equally mediated by technology tales like Roma. Technology has always, by and large, had a positive impact on telling stories. His view is, if you want to keep on being relevant as a director, and I personally would say this of any filmmaker, I think you need to have to embrace the times, and with the times come technologies and formats. But of course, and if we return to our cave painters, we can witness these two worlds colliding to become something extraordinary. Our cave painting ancestors would be bemused, perhaps, to see Google Art and Culture's latest VR digitization efforts. Early in 2020, the, pa the paintings we saw earlier the, in Chauveau Cave in Ardèche in France were brought to life 36,000 years later. It's a remarkable feat and the only way you can come close to standing in the cave itself. A 360 tour or interactive documentary is available and is a real treat, an illustration of the new and exciting ways of bringing history, stories to life. I would encourage you all to search it out on YouTube. It's an example of what Alfonso Cuaron believes and how technology in this case shapes our understanding of the past and allows us to experience it in more visceral and well, in a more visceral way. Indeed, extraordinary stories are being told in ever more imaginative ways such as this. And it is the intersection of the creatives and the technologists that perhaps the most interesting and challenging work may originate. 
At the same time, the core tenets of good storytelling remain. The film is boring, like Battlefield Earth was. It doesn't matter how much money you spend on it, no one or perhaps not enough people will watch it. Yet students need to be well-versed in modern technologies if they're to succeed in the ever-changing world of the screen arts. How we capture stories is an area where technology is having a pronounced effect from phones to DSLRs to higher end cameras. The quality of image capture is now extraordinary. Digital cameras are one thing, but lighting too has been revolutionized by LEDs. What we can capture on our phones and edit on our laptops is several magnitudes better than the technology available to George Lucas when first directing Star Wars. What is achievable with computer generated imagery is truly astonishing. Here we see the work of one of IDT's, uh, this is the MA in 3D animation students, Ji Zhang. His work is, I feel, extraordinary. It's increasingly lifelike imagery like this that is possible. No matter how we feel about Princess Leia through, flying through space, it really is extraordinary what can be achieved. Then, of course, there's the latest buzz around volumetric cinema. It seems in this and in many other things, size does matter. Now, I'm sure we're overly familiar with this, but volumetric cinema is quite possibly a revolutionary step forward in computer generated technology. Green screen, however, seamless it seemed, was always very CGI. What is being achieved now with Unreal Engine is incredible. The implications for storytelling are significant. It does ask the question, of course, of us as educators, policymakers, and those tasked with setting the direction of the screen and media arts. How do we keep up? We do not, perhaps. We can expose students to enough of the nice toys not to feel left out, and more importantly, devise learning that will enable them to adapt and upskill when they move into industry. The graduate film or the graduate short film is the ultimate goal of most film school students. However, in an increasingly noisy world, finding your audience is more difficult. This is the last hurdle in a process that anyone involved in the screen arts must navigate. It becomes as much about business skills as anything else, and understanding your audience and how to find it becomes ever more important. Developing strategies that allow students to build the entrepreneurial skills needed to succeed are increasingly seen as vital to creative practice. There is, of course, no end of new ways of telling stories and new forms of technologies driven by video, however surface in nature and, and the narrative, narrative might be. Social media video traffic by volume is approaching 82% of all internet traffic, according to Cisco, and we as educators must look to respond. I would suggest that much of the content is of questionable quality, but that's not a reason for us to ignore it. We as film school educators should perhaps look at leading out on these issues to ensure that the quality can be, good, can be as good as it can be. Not meaning to be patronizing, but if you mean to make cat videos, then they should at least be the best cat videos they can be. At the higher end of the video market, Netflix Bandersnatch is often used as an example of new narrative constructs. In my view, it did not live up to the hype despite its excellent production values, but it does point to a very real future. The next leap forward is the ability of artificial intelligence to create stories. It is perhaps intimidating, even an anathema, to how we feel about story and how it is an art form, but it is coming and we need to engage with it. For the filmmaker, interdisciplinary practice is a context, constant. Every department and crew member needs to work to serve the story. New or traditional forms of storytelling apply. Everyone working on the film or piece of content needs to serve the story if it is to be successful. Designers, costume, character, production, sound, all of the above and more. In researching this talk, an idea I had not considered before in any real detail was the idea of the story world. Not just the narrative story, but the whole world in which the story inhabits. In Mark Wolf's Building Imaginary Worlds, 2012, he explores in fascinating detail how, through verbal description, visual design, or virtual spaces revealed through interaction, it is the world that supports all the narratives set in it, and that is constantly present during the audience's experience, and that experience may or may not include narrative. The first chapter talks about the history of subcreation and the rules that apply. As a Tolkien and Star Wars fan, it deals in some detail about both. Much is made of the invention, completeness, consistency of the world that Tolkien created, Arda, the world where Middle Earth takes place and how much is consistent and believable. Star Wars has become a famous example of world building. The most recent trilogy achieved incredible consistency in terms of world building and design elements as can be seen in these two images. And these are something that all educators need to be conscious of, even though not everyone always agrees. So if we are to build new pedagogies or perhaps adapt familiar models to new scenarios that build on what has worked in the past and apply them in new contexts, we need a new overall framework to help us deliver on the challenges outlined here. 
creative schools are familiar with project-based learning. Film EU is adapting it for the future. Samsara is the name of the new pedagogical model initiated and implemented by Film EU. Its central tenet is that artistic teaching and research is a practice-based collaborative endeavor that engages with societal problems via the intensive use of technological mediation. The challenges and responses outlined in this presentation are well suited to this framework. Samsara encompasses a collection of concepts and imperatives, as well as specific processes and techniques for activating them. In addition, the model considers the technological, logistical and ethical infrastructure needed to support and enable its pedagogical goals. Samsara's starting point is the belief that how we learn is as important as what we learn. Film EU sees media arts not only as an object of study, but also as a meaning generating system, a tool for creativity and a pedagogical asset. This approach is grounded in competencies deeply rooted and continuing, continually being developed in the cultural and creative industries community. Thus, it takes project-based learning and adds new layers and sophistication to include other forms and approaches to teaching, most notably challenge-based challenge learning. In essence, providing learners with a specific challenge, societal, environmental, or topical challenges, for example, as part of the project. In so doing, learners are not only encouraged to apply craft, process, and their own creativity, but also respond to a set of issues. This brings added layers of context, develops their critical awareness, is that safe and supported space to learn and deal with challenges that incrementally builds their competencies and confidence, enables learners to teach themselves and work in an interdisciplinary team. Each person develops his or her chosen craft skills, but in a context that engenders, engenders social outlook. The technology is at once important but agnostic. To paraphrase John Lasseter, technology informs the art and the art inspires the technology. This, I conclude, is the central philosophy of Film U and perhaps the answer I should have given to that animation student five years ago. It is, I believe, I have demonstrated quite a bit more than might be learned from a YouTube video. I am, however, forever grateful to that student and her challenge to me. We are all learning all the time, including myself, and we need to be open to that. Thank you. That's great, Ronan. Thanks. I'll just remind everyone to straight away get questions into the, into the box if they're going to reach us on time. Um, just maybe you could talk a little bit more about the challenges. You know, you mentioned about challenges to educators, specifically in, in Ireland or IADT's context. Can you expand a little bit on that? Um, I, well, I suppose there's a couple of elements to that. I mean, one of the big, um, I mean, it, there's some very practical and operational issues, as we've been discovering in Film EU, um, even lining up calendars can be a real issue if you want to, if you want to inculcate a whole idea of interdisciplinarity or opportunities for people to work together um, from different disciplines, um, even timetabling it is, is a real challenge. So one of the approaches we've taken here is actually trying to standardize um, the timetables across programs. Um, we're not, um, we sort of, a, a, and I as, an, a, as, as a manager, I'm not trying to, I'm not telling people what to teach, but at least by arranging things in a particular order so that things kind of line up, it allows for the opportunities for, for interdisciplinary practice to happen organically, um, just by simply allowing for certain modules to happen at the same time. Um, so it's those kinds of practical things. I mean, I think you can get bogged down or one can get bogged down in the kind of the, 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 the broader philosophies, which of course, of course are important. Um, but if you don't have kind of the basic groundwork laid out or, or, and if, you know, if you don't provide those opportunities. Um, and, I, and, and sometimes I feel, and I think back to our own history as a, as a film school, that I would have worked with a lot of, um, uh, sort of those, that first generations of film, filmmakers that came out of the film school. Um, and for them, it would, what their, their overriding memory of their education here is they were just literally given a safe box in which to work um, and to kind of be creative. And, and I think that's, for me, that's kind of been a, a guiding light that it's, it's ultimately it's about providing, you know, a bit of structure, a bit of shape, um, a, a, a supported environment um, where students can, can, can explore um, their, their own creativity and their own ideas. Um, you know, I mean, because there are enough restrictions around health and safety and yada, 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 all these kinds of things. So if we can strip all that back a bit, um, that that might, that, that would encourage them to be as creative as possible. I think the idea of challenge-based learning is really interesting though as well, I mean, sort of that, that 
that you kind of inject a little bit of kind of focus for students as well. I mean, that you, because as you know, that here's a problem that we might want to fix. I mean, Mariana really very beautifully outlined their um, a real set of problems that we're all facing. And I think it's the kind of thing that films should be grappling with as an idea, for example. Um, and, you know, the whole, and how do we represent that? I mean, um, I mean, in my text version, I acknowledge that a lot of help I got from colleagues on this paper, but um, Dr. Deirdre Toole and her PhD was working a lot on, on the sea, actually, through film uh, and, and water and things like that. So you could just imagine someone like her working with Mariana, um, an artist, to create something really, really interesting, like, you know, um, and that's, that's, that, 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 that kind of pushes the boundaries just a little bit. I mean, I, I don't believe, you know, we're not going to reinvent the wheel here, but like there's, there's, there's definite opportunities to do stuff that, that might, be, might, might just might get people thinking. Sure. And like in terms of film and in its traditional sense in a, in a kind of a college environment, do you think it's, is it compatible with these new forms of storytelling or is there a challenge there? Um, there is, there's always going to be, um, and, um, and, and especially for students who come in um, sort of 18, 19 years of age, and they're really excited, and they've, they've gotten to a film school, and they just want to make films. Um, I suppose, again, it's kind of, uh, it goes back to what I was saying there a moment ago, like, it's kind of providing those contexts, I think, um, where, again, students are, are there, there's opportunities for them to try things if they want to. Um, I, I, I'm not, a, I'm, I wouldn't be a fan of sort of making, now you have to do a film in this format and now you have to make a film in that format. Um, I mean, obviously there's certain practicalities around these things, because, um, but at the same time, um, you know, we're not asking film students to make cat videos, you know, and, and I, I'm not trying to be glib about it because, you know, there's a, a huge market for cat videos, you know, um, but it's, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's at least if we give them the, the, the real core um, sense of, you know, for me, like it's attention to detail, it's you know an eye for quality and and and, and just you know standards that they they're always pushing themselves ir irrespective of what they're doing. And if they're comfortable in whatever technology, they can flip uh, in any direction. I, I suppose just speaking of technology as well, um, like a number of years ago when mobile phones are getting better and better, and they are getting better and better, and, and everybody's kind of like, well, we don't need Alexa cameras, we don't need lenses, we just need a mobile phone. And then that's kind of all being washed away by some mega high technology in terms of, in terms of you know what's happening with the Mandalorian and everything like that. And you, in terms of a film school and how we teach film, is there a balance there, or, or do we just you know, <laughs> what way do what way do we solve that? Uh, well, yeah, the fundamental cinema one terrifies me, I have to say. <laughs> but again, but it, but it, it's completely it's exciting quite, though. You have to say it is a completely it's exciting. Very exciting. Way of it's very exciting. But but I suppose like what what bit of that can we like. Can we teach? I mean, you know, and it's. I suppose the, the important bit about that for a, for a cinematographer, for example, is how they communicate with the technologist. Because you know, the cinematographer isn't going to be programming or, or, or designing things in Unreal. But even if, like, you can can do kind of proto kind of versions of these things, where at least the, the important bit is that the cinematographer gets an opportunity he or she to talk to the to the to the, the technologist bits. Because it, I mean, it's as much about lighting as anything else. Because now with what they're having with volumetric cinemas, they're, they're being lit by the world around them. Um, so there's all sorts of, you know, it's those kinds of considerations. So I think we can um, do those things. I mean, phones have a place in everything, but I mean, for it, but it's, but it's, you know, but for me, it's actually, and actually the, you know, just like apps that, that you, you hear about that they are used for kind of doing recce and all sorts of, that help you create storyboards and all the rest of it. So they're just tools for telling the stories. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm in the face saying it, I suppose, but it's a long, you know, I, I mean, you know, I know the story of a student, we, my very first year here, and, and they got very, very, very excited about anamorphic lenses, and I had all sorts of trouble trying to organize insurance, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and when you, know, you were naive, that I was, when you were naive. I <laughs> Perhaps I still am. Um, but, you know, and the film looked beautiful, but I mean, the story didn't quite work. And, and, and so it looked like amazing, and, 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 they, and they, the students poured their heart and soul into the you know, um, so you know, you can ease students easily, and the, the number of examples along the way where, where you get distracted, and I suppose we all do occasionally by the technology and, and lose sight of, of, of the key the issues. I mean, I'm interested in what you think in terms of the, that technology. I mean, we, we always, it's always the mantra that, you know, it's, it's just a tool, it's a tool for storytelling, and, and I think that is probably true, but I think traditionally we look at 
you know, the screenwriter and maybe the director, definitely the director and maybe the creative producer as being the storytellers. Um, and to me, something seems to have changed recently that, that storytel- the storytelling role is being somewhat democratized by the technology. And that actually, and I think one of the things that we're looking at in, in, um, in Story Lab at IADT is to look at those different elements of story. And do you, do you have any view on, you know, that that cinematographer is looking for an anamorphic lens? Is, is he more of a storyteller today than he was 10 or 15 years ago? Or do you think it's just they've always been storytellers? I look at this, I suppose, just through the prism of being a producer, my experience of being a producer, insofar as like, I, like, I, I, I can't pick up a camera. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not particularly good at editing or any of those things. But it's about pulling together people who are all working towards the same, towards the same goal. So I think everyone has always been as equally important in that, in that nexus, if you like. I mean, I suppose, you know, people do talk about the, the triangle between the writer and the producer and the cinematographer. Or, you know, the, but it, it, it shifts as the production goes along. Like you know, but I remember we had we had a. Um, a production designer whose name escapes me for a talk um, uh, and we talked a little bit about uh, a brooch um, and uh, she had done the production design for um, uh, the queen and, and they, they just talked we, we, we had a five minute conversation about the choices that were made about a particular brooch and how the brooch was going to be a motif in the story and the brooch that the, the character the queen wore um, was always going to be ever present so it really needed to serve the story. And I, I just, I love that level of attention to detail that, that you know, that's the, the understanding that um, you need to be uh, as, as focused on the minutia as anything else. Because, uh, and even if you recall, there was an Irish um, director who won the um, short film, best short film a number of years ago uh, about a, a deaf person who, who falls in love. And it was just a beautiful, beautiful story, I forget the name of it now. But I remember, I can really recall this one particular shot, the camera just tilted over and the table kind of, he, the character was sort of typing away. And just the, the, the production design, I mean, it's simple enough, but just the, the items that were placed on the table and what that told us about the person um, was fascinating. So like, so in answer to your question, like, I don't think it's changed at all. I mean, ultimately, like, I mean, certainly like there are more bodies and more, and there's more elements and you have to be more conscious of, of how the effects or whatever else might be interacting with you down the line. And then the, you feel like the pipeline has changed. Um, but at the same time, ultimately, like everyone has to have a responsibility to making sure it works. You know? sure. Brilliant. Ron, thank you so much. Um, that, was, that was brilliant. Uh, we are actually on time, which means we can actually have a coffee break. Uh, and I can see it. Erica was waiting to come on and she, she's, <laughs> she's kind of a little bit relieved for a second. But it's 10.54 and I think we're due for the next speaker for Erica at, at uh, 10.54 or 11.54, depending on which time zone we're in. Um, so we're going to come back in 15 minutes, I think. If you're on the Zoom, maybe um, don't, just, just mute and stop your video rather than, than reconnecting in. Uh, and we'll all see you in... Actually, YouTube is in a slightly different time. So we'll see you in 15 minutes. Um, okay, brilliant. See you then. Thank you.
Welcome back, everybody. Uh, hopefully you can see and you can hear us. Hi, Erica. Um, uh, next, I'd like to, to introduce Erica Rodriguez from Lusophona, who will present best practices in artistic research from the Film EU Alliance. Erica is a filmmaker, curator and lecturer. She holds a BA in film and video from the University of the Arts in London and an MA in television drama from Goldsmiths. She's a PH candidate at Burbeck University of London, her work as a filmmaker granted her a Skillset Millennium Fellowship Award for a series of documentaries on the role of art in the life of refugees. She's founding director of Utopia, a UK Portuguese film festival. In 2017, she created Underscore, a festival of music, sound, moving image and archive. Um, and in 2020, she secured a grant from ICA in Portugal to direct a documentary on Portuguese pioneer women filmmakers. So over to you, Erica. Thank you. Um, thank you, Barry. Uh, I will start with a brief uh, introduction. Female institutions collaborate around the common objective of jointly promoting high-level education, innovation and research activities in the multidisciplinary field of film and media arts and through this collaboration, consolidate the central role of Europe as a world leader in the creative fields and promote the relevance of culture and aesthetical values for our social well-being. In order to pursue its objectives, FUMEO will promote the expansion and improvement of the joint research capacity of the partner institutions and their ability to disseminate with greater impact the creative outcomes resulting from the education and research endeavors they support further reinforcing the preeminence of artistic research in the European higher education area. In order to attain such objectives, FUMEO will promote the implementation of a common model for practice and artistic based research that consolidates alternative paths for PhD in this field and reinforces the social impact of the knowledge produced in the institutions that integrate the Alliance. All of this will be grounded in a common research agenda, focusing on artistic research that will nurture joint research clusters and groups. In order to facilitate this, this initial work was conducted with the objectives of situating artistic research in the context of other disciplines. We started by questioning what is the role of artistic research in meeting contemporary global and social challenges while surveying existing theories, methodologies, and approaches in artistic research. In order to attain these objectives, a joint task force was set up consisting of heads of research, in full partners, and experts from associated partners and other AGI. The purpose of this presentation is to share our brainstorming with external experts in the field of artistic research. And now I will proceed to share my screen. Uh, just bear with me a moment. Okay. Okay. I hope can any we can see. We can see. Do you want to just check moving forward and back? Okay. Yes. Perfect. 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 Thank you, Barry. Uh, so this will, will be an overview, as mentioned, of uh, the brainstorming we had with uh, external specialists in the field of artistic research, because there is this idea at the heart of filming that we are fluid and open in terms of receiving perspectives, feedback, receiving knowledge, sharing knowledge. So I will start with our first guest, and this happened on the 17th of February, and it was Jyoti Mistri from the University of Gothenburg, and I will share now some of her thoughts. So there is this idea that uh, this uh, notion of art research, it's quite early in film history. So it started as, um, it's, it's documented as starting uh, we, in conversation with film practice, uh, starting with Sergeant Eisenstein. So it goes a long way. So it's, it's uh, quite relevant that it's not settled yet and not assumed in terms of institu institutional practice, but there is uh, definitely 
a mystery that goes by in terms of um, connecting these notions of theory and practice. Artistic research is not unfamiliar to those of us who teach in film and have a long history in film uh, education, precisely because uh, in terms of all the materialities of film, in a way, uh, we can find already this idea that uh, there, there needs to be a certain search in terms of passing from theory to practice, in terms of challenge from uh, joining the theoretical knowledge with the practical knowledge. We're dealing with the way the legacy of the history of film schools has actually been separated from art schools. And that's why film schools come rather late in the picture of artistic research. This, is a, uh, this was a, a main point uh, for our speaker. And um, going from Mariana Pestana's talk to, to mine uh, and the conversations in between, I think this is in a way, it's a, it's a key thought that we need to hold on. Uh, this notion that perhaps uh, we've parted things in a way and that uh, shouldn't be happen happening at the moment in academia with this se a separation from artistic research, from film schools and basing it uh, in, the, in art schools or uh, in also in language schools where, for instance, you can have the example of uh, film studies, for instance. Because then what is very important to have uh, in our hearts is this, this key question of what function does the creative project serve? We do not, do not have enough people skilled enough to grade the work creation. Um, this is a constant topic uh, across the presentation. Is this the case? How can we uh, make, uh, uh, create a staff that is capacitated to grade and evaluate artistic work. Often evaluation of the film amounts to a film review. So we need to go be beyond this. This was fundamental for this speaker. And use artistic research to rethink the methods of teaching. This seems, for this speaker, this seems to uh, be key in terms of how we can move forward. So the fact that we want to undertake artistic research needs to make us consider what should be our methodologies as teachers as well. And uh, the video essay, again, is a tool that is very important. It's part of uh, the history of film and more and more it's used to express uh, knowledge, uh, to showcase research, uh, to be pieces of work that in their own right um, are, act like, as a bridge between these, these concepts, between the theory and the practice. Film studies is still in the business of literary criticism, not in the business of creating ideas. Use films to comment and rewrite ideas. And this idea of using film itself as a tool of, expre of expression, liberating us, us from, the, from the writing uh, a film, an object that gives us uh, conceptual perspectives in its own right. We have to make a sharp distinction between producing epistemological and aesthetic inquiry. And it, it's in these two uh, notions that is very important that we bear in mind that the critical perspective uh, is paramount. So. Uh, to not have in film schools perhaps this perspective that on one side you have the ones that think about film and the, and, and the others that do the practice of, of, of film. How can we join everything together? How can we address these issues of um, combining and discussing in terms of uh, PhD, PhD level, research level, all these things, that is the major challenge. Filmmakers are doing research all the time. If you are making a film about the future, you're doing research to increase the authenticity. But this is research for stories, not necessarily for epistemological purpose. And this is the key thing 
as well. That uh, it's not for the fact that you make a film that this film is necessarily part of a research. It all depends on the methodology that it's used. A film can be a product of research, but not necessarily. Uh, then I'm going to share with all uh, the, pre uh, the presentations and the ideas of Suzanne Alka from Auto University, and she was with us on the 24th of March, 2021. So this research uh, was led at the film, television and scenography department. And it's it was concentrate concentrated on practice led research and artistic, artistic research within cinema. So she had quite a focused approach. And uh, the main ideas were why? An objective of integrating research in the film practice programs, art schools, how does the theorizing or research con conducted in the film, fil uh, film school context differ from academic film studies? So these are again, uh, questions that are repeating itself. What are the specificities of film schools and knowledge production? To whom, to what produce? Again, there's a sense of a common history. So we have the reference to Serge uh, Eisenstein again. And this notion uh, that concepts, ideas, proposals, we are just not conceptual findings, theor theoretical concepts, but ideas which would not exist without these films. So this idea of the film that search for an idea. So as an object objective, catalyzing new expressions, new practice, artistic research within art practice rather than cataloging already existing research on the art and, and in humanities. Uh, Suzanne was able also to show us in how they were developing this at her institution with all um, kinds of aspects from a virtual cinema lab, to a critical cinema lab, to all uh, sorts of pro projects where these questions were being addressed. So the main, uh, one of the main issues at this stage, it's for us to consider what are then the difference between a practice-led research versus an artistic research. And here it's where uh, it arises uh, uh, some often confusion. So if we have practice-led research, uh, the methods are uh, qualitative methods. Uh, the practice-led research questions stem from the experience of practitioners. Utilization of qualitative materials, talk, text, audio, visual, data, etc., to hear the voice of other agencies in practice and to understand professionals' tacit knowledge. Practical and insider knowledge is developed into a deeper understanding, which aims at transforming the ways of practicing, writing, positioning the practitioner, grounded theory, autoethnography, case studies, interviews. Uh, Susan also uh, gave us the example at her institution of several ongoing doctoral research projects. Um, and we can see the, that it's quite profuse and it's very rich in terms of uh, the research that is currently happening and that we should be aware of with uh, roughly 50, uh, 50 projects practice-led uh, practice research. And then we have artistic research within film, artistic research as critical praxis, artistic work as an essential part of the research process, theoretical and philosophical frameworks in dialogical relationship with artistic work, the role of the artwork sinking within art, art practice. So I would say sinking within film practice, artist work is a method, a context, a subject, an object, and an outcome of the research process. Uh, and in terms of writing, it's precisely positioning the artist. So in this case, in the case of the, of, of the film, uh, the filmmaker, 
So in terms of uh, artistic research, Suzanne was also um, able to give us um, a basis in terms of um, uh, relevant uh, references. I can say that there is a lot that is being written currently on the topic um, across Europe. So this is definitely a key topic because it's, it's a moment where we are um, analyzing the status quo and considering uh, across countries in what direction we should move and how we can converge as institutions in terms of uh, the quality assurance that we all have for artistic research. She gave us also this example of um, a very important uh, source, Robin Nelson, uh, in terms of the modes of uh, modes of knowing, uh, multimodal ep epistemological model uh, for um, uh, practical uh, artistic research, and in, the general idea is this notion of the the, the know-how, of course, the performer knowledge, uh, the the praxis, the theory imbricated within uh, uh, practice, the know what, the critical reflection, the explicit knowledge. Uh, the, prax uh, the practitioner that has this action for research and, uh, and this notion of the know that, the conceptual framework, this is the, the, the key thing. And it's, it's something that appears and appears again in terms of how we create a, frame, a framework that is um, sustain sustainable and uh, accountable in terms of how it's um, evaluated. Suzanne left us with, <laughs> with, many, uh, with many questions, uh, as most of our guests, um, I should say at this stage that we will create uh, a video and a report that encompasses all of these um, highlights and bubbles of thoughts and questions because they are definitely many. Uh, but uh, some of them are very practical and I'm just going to name from this um, uh, from this selection, I'm just going to, to quote uh, and read a few. For instance, does the funding for PhD come from inside the institutions or are persons stimulated to search for external funding? The issue of PhD funding for artistic research is very important and key at the moment if we want to develop the work in the fields. Um, for instance, at, uh, in, uh, at Susanna's institutions, because of the lack of funding, several of the students uh, undertake this work uh, as a hobby. Is, is this the way we want to move for, forward? Probably. If we want to have solid artistic research, probably not. Then I continue with Andrea uh, B. Bright from the Elia European League for the Institutes of the Arts and Andrea was with us on April 28th. So in terms of uh, his main thoughts, uh, something important um, is this, to have an accountant and, 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 and sometimes perhaps there's where this uh, is where students are more confused. Um, that artistic research is a research that goes beyond self, uh, self flexibility. So it's something that it goes beyond that idea that uh, you're doing work just uh, as an author uh, centered on yourself and, and you are not able to explain why, for instance. This is an example of something that doesn't, uh, it's not accountable. Therefore, it can be addressed uh, and uh, and analyzed and validated. Then uh, Andrea bought us uh, a very um, interesting concept uh, that uh, uh, in his institution, uh, if you do not hold a PhD, but you are a professor, you are able to supervise a PhD if you are a practitioner. And um, this idea is uh, most relevant because for all kinds of reasons across uh, Europe, this is a, a major point of conflict and discussion because certain countries uh, for cultural uh, historical reasons only assume that PhD uh, holders will be able um, to supervise a PhD and not do not consider um, the relevance and the ability 
of uh, a, pra a, a, practic a practitioner with teaching and experience of the in the field to undertake this supervision. Uh, transdis transdisciplinary research can have film at the center and not merely an auxiliary device. And so this is again uh, the idea that how can we move on from this, idea, uh, this notion that the written test is the, it's the, it's what validates research, what is written. Um, and, and let's assume that the film, the film as an ob object, object can be at the center and can give this validation and it doesn't need to be secondary to, to writing. And so Andrea proceeds to, to provoke us saying that film can address film research just with filmic means. And, and this perhaps it's the, the greatest challenge um, to consider that film as a tool is as, in, uh, as important and re relevant and accountable and can be evaluated uh, as written work. In order to produce artistic research, you must be an artist and produce artistic research by your artistic means. So it's this notion that artistic research needs to be done by someone that is a, 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 a practitioner, someone that has knowledge within that film, within that practice, and so it has the appropriate tools to develop it. Artistic research is important for enabling artists to continue their studies after the MA, access funding, and the first cycle of higher education studies, otherwise would be unfair. So it's this perspective uh, for Andrea that in some European countries currently, um, uh, artists uh, are sometimes blocked from funding that is majorly tailored for um, the people that in that field of work develop the theory work. So that perhaps is uh, something that is not fair and should be addressed. That uh, the practitioners have as much opportunity to assess funding as the theorists. Not only artists with a PhD should be able to do artistic res research. So uh, that is uh, perhaps the essential idea um, and one uh, that probably in many European countries will uh, take some time and discussion to be established in terms of its validation. But then again, like uh, in science and Andrea brought this notion that research needs intuition. Uh, and if we, we shouldn't have that pre uh, prejudice against this word because if intuition is seen as something that is used and the knowledge that is being used in science, why can't it have a, a space and be important as well, uh, as well in terms of the work of a practitioner? Uh, but in terms of how the supervision could be uh, undertaken, uh, an idea was that uh, let the project develop freely, but then the researcher must make themselves accountable for what they have done. So again, it's this notion that it can be relied only in self-reflexibility, but it needs to be accountable to others. And from the moment it's accountable to, to others, it's already uh, manifesting itself as so a solid research. Artistic research is important for enabling artists, artists to continue their studies after an MA, a sex funding, and the first cycle of higher education studies, otherwise would be unfair. So this is key. We need to see how we place these practitioners. Let's not forget this, uh, this notion. Now I proceed to Stephen Glass from the Association European des, des Conservatoires, Académie de Musique et Musique music cautions and he was with us on uh, April 22nd and uh, he had again uh, uh, questions uh, what uh, and uh, the first ones that we addressed to him were what do you think artistic research means how do you think that we can connect higher education activity with research 
and um, it was uh, immediately established uh, that in the past there was this distinction between the artistic performance and artistic research, not practitioners. And now we need to move forward. Uh, again, this notion that the research should be carried by a practitioner, uh, we're having um, uh, breakthroughs. Um, uh, is, uh, historic informal performance started in the 1960s. Again, this notion of an, uh, an, an history, a sense of history in terms of grounding artistic research. Um, the performance sector comes out with questions that can only be answered by academic. So this uh, notion that what the artist uh, is um, and uh, doing his outputs are relevant and can uh, certain questions can only be answered in the in the academic environment and nowhere else. These questions are different from the ones uh, the ones considered by those who are only theorists. Artistic research is, is another type of scientific research and needs to be taken into account. If there is not a research question, it it. It's not artistic research, it's just someone performing innovative performance. And in terms of uh, this notion of the co collective or individual artistic research, um, he mentioned that uh, science Nobel Prize winners are always the head of a team, part of a collective. Why shouldn't artistic research be a collective effort? We should be, go beyond the idea of the genius of the 19th century. And this probably it's a, a, a key idea uh, to have uh, at our institutions. Uh, proceeding with the questions, how to get public recognition at the education and research level, how to obtain funding, how to obtain legis uh, legitimization recognition. And then um, some challenges, standards of higher education are very different across Europe. Uh, the challenge of establishing new perspectives in artistic research, certain types of uh, research are recognized in one country and not in another. And then uh, as examples, for instance, in Austria, there is a separate law for higher education institutions. They have the same funding and are considered at the same level as any comprehensive university. While in Greece, a high level, high quality quality conservatoire in Athens providing education in music is not recognized, not allowed to deliver diplomas. If you do a bachelor's there, you can do a master's in London, but this will not be recognized by the Greek government. In Greece, visual artists are more recognized than musicians. So it's this discrepancy in standards that he highlighted. Um, and uh, also the fact that differences between countries are historic and mostly stem as far as, as from the 19th century. And then again, we go back to the epistemological issue. What is research and what is special about artistic research when compa compared to other kinds of research? Um, we go to the importance of the Frascatic manual and, um, and the, these three distinct notions that are the ones we're battling with, research on arts, research through arts, research about arts. And this can be the point of conflict. Important questions here are how can traditional researchers and artists cooperate? How can we increase communications? And then, uh, but there are some, um, there is some optimism here because funding for traditional research is decreasing and being allocated to new forms of research. So it is worthwhile to be more creative in the field. Then again, the questions, where do you draw the line between artistic research and artistic expressions? How do we meet the criteria? Artistic expression not being itself an act of research, if not transferable or re replicable. And these are the two key things. Uh, this, uh, the issue of being transferable and the issue that it's something that it can be replicated. Um, and then he gave us examples uh, uh, in terms of the field of music, the score, composition, writing on paper, the performance, the creative process, all this can be artistic this research, but not necessarily again. A musician is innovative based on his or very personal experience, and therefore this is not transferable to someone else. As a counterexample, there are people who are excellent performers but are unable to teach practitioners who are not able to reflect on what they do. Transferability and reproducibility are more difficult to define in artistic research. To aim at transferability is essential something that can be used by someone else in a systematic way. Um, 
to, to conclude Stefan Glass's thoughts, the PhD has in many countries become the condition to become a lecturer in the performing arts. Dependence on a PhD for a high position in teaching is merging things that should be separated. Epistemological purpose of research should be separated from obtaining a qualification. It is vital the articulation between education and research, art research strengthens social cohesion, epistemological purpose of research should be separated from obtaining a qualification, artistic research as a practice that could not be done in any other way. So <laughs> I'm not going to highlight uh, this notion, but it's, I think it is key that artistic research as a practice that could not be done in any, in any other way that needs to be undertaken under the uh, academic umbrella. Uh, then we, um, we had uh, the insights of Elena Rusinova from the Ru uh, Russian State University of Cinematography. And again, it was a very uh, profuse uh, brainstorm and it helped us to understand uh, how her organization had uh, set up uh, artistic research uh, at uh, different levels. Um, and again, it was this issue of how uh, to supervise it and perhaps uh, to also face that in certain aspects there, there are um, different uh, ba barriers that have been established for quite uh, sometimes, um, for instance, at, uh, at her institution, um, these, um, these two different positions between uh, the theoretical academic research and then uh, the practical research assistant internships and the way and the skills that are necessary and what uh, is the focus on of one uh, program and, and the other. And perhaps what we are trying to achieve here at Filmeo is precisely something that uh, unites these classical uh, perspectives uh, expressed here. That is uh, the ultimate frontier, the, the challenges uh, between things, uh, courses, methods of evalu evaluation that have been established across European institutions and perhaps have um, become uh, stale in terms of how uh, they can be used for this progression. Uh, we had also uh, an overview uh, in terms of how um, research and e e investigation is undertaken at uh, this university that follows uh, a very classical um, uh, model of uh, arts uh, universities. And then uh, she also uh, provides us with uh, the idea of what uh, was happening uh, in terms of uh, production, self-projects, workshops, internships, um, conferences, uh, everything that helped to consolidate, uh, consolidate uh, the work of uh, the researchers. Um, again, this notion of um, uh, collecting knowledge and uh, exper experience of reflection on, um, on practice, um, of allowing students to consolidate and acquire creative and technical skills, and that independent work leading to self-organizational and productional uh, research skills. Uh, uh, she went, uh, uh, our guest went into detail in terms of the practical research internships and uh, the the importance of this um, of these aspects of the disciplinary specific additional training for these advanced skills of the regulations for teachers of uh, uh, joining these notions of um, higher education pedagogy and psychology communication training production experience. Um, all helping to, to consolidate this experience. Uh, we are also confronted with different models of, of PhD and how to undertake uh, uh, undertake and them. Again, this highlight of how um, there isn't, uh, it's not consensual. Uh, here we can see another model in terms of um, how uh, to, to lead these supervisions 
Um, but uh, some aspects of it, of course, are similar with the, the previous uh, uh, with the previous speaker um, in this notion that uh, self motivation of of the student uh, it's key to undertake the project. Uh, to finalize, we had Ka uh, Kahal Matlogin from Queen's University in Belfast, and he gave us uh, this notion uh, that is still um, something that sometimes in terms of assessment panels, um, it's not easy when uh, projects are mainly uh, practice-based. Uh, so if we look at the top, it's this notion of the le uh, legitimization of creative research. Where does the creative originality exist? The writing allows the artist to explain the context of their research. And the written reflections help students contextualize and define their work through their own methodology and theoretical framework. And uh, with, in this regard, it was uh, an opportunity to, uh, to understand um, how a uh, devaluation process uh, takes place, that creative output can be anything but needs to be justified uh, by the candidate and uh, examiners need to have empathy towards the research and understand the interdisciplinary nature of it. And it was highlighted as an example uh, of having the examiners that are not uh, experienced in uh, analyzing artistic research, that are more uh, experienced in terms of an analysis that is of theory worked. Um, this uh, has led for certain instances of uh, candidates uh, feeling that the evaluation was not correct one. Um, in terms of the AV PhD supervisors and examiners formers, um, it was mentioned what are the rules and regulations uh, and again many questions. Um, how, what ought the students to produce at an upgrade? When should they transfer from MPhil to PhD? How should the practice and written th thesis relate? Should the practice be seen first? Should there be two vivas, an important issue, one for the practice, one for the theory? How professional should the practice be? Who is qualified to examine? <laughs> and what are the practical, financial, and institutional barriers? So we, just within these questions, uh, there are <laughs> all, uh, few of the issues that we need to uh, address if we want to converge across Europe um, and if we want to establish uh, an artistic research that is uh, as validated as research in other fields of work and that is secures solid funding. Um, in this, uh, in this uh, slide, you can see also um, this notion of uh, the, the research output. Uh, this again, this notion that the research uh, on the film contact and that the film process uh, is the, the, the research practice. Again, we can see that all of our guests from very uh, uh, distant um, organizations from different countries uh, assume the role of the film. Uh, the film as an object in artistic research as something that needs to be definitely validated. Um, to give you the possibility of uh, an insight in this part of the conversation. Um, uh, questions that are important here is are what contests are they working in, the students, and what knowledge are they adding? What frontier are they trying to break? The standards of creative outputs is paramount. Where the research lies within the practice should be articulated in the proposal and ulti ultimately in the thesis. What originally is the candidate aiming to bring? So these are all questions at the start of initi initiating uh, a solid artistic research that should we should be uh, taking um, into account. So uh, to 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 conclude, something that is definitely up uh, uh, to definition and then needs to be consolidated at European level is how we define artistic research, how we use um, uh, proper methodolo methodologies to converge in terms of assessment, in terms of how we established, 
in terms of how students understand it and how, are, how they are prepared. Uh, here at Filmeo, this is just uh, the start of something that is indeed quite complex and needs to be solidified. Um, and um, we can uh, perceive just from this small pool that the, the conflicts and uh, um, the battle in terms of um, converging and overcoming uh, traditions and cultural per perspectives is quite big, but that some um, key developments have happened uh, recently in the field. Uh, there are definitely uh, quite a profusion of lectures, academics and written work on the topic, as well as proper artistic research that is coming out of research um, and universities. I would like to, to finalize uh, saying that this uh, work and this compilation is part of a collective and I would like to thank in particular my colleagues Didier O'Toole from IADT and Martin uh, Koenigheart uh, from LUCA. Uh, with that, uh, without them uh, it would have uh, been impossible uh, in uh, such short time to already have uh, all these pers uh, perspectives. Thank you. Thanks, Erica. Um, that was brilliant. Um, I mean, I think it, it's it's clear that you guys have been very busy over the last few months, but it's also clear that it's incredibly important, I think, for any new university to be able to look at these things because we have, I think, an opportunity um, to um, to lead, I suppose, a little bit. Um, you you went through a lot, which has left us slightly short of time. So we might just have one or two very quick questions, if that's okay. Uh, and one of the questions we have in is, do, did you find more in common or more differences across this two, new type of research? Um, finally enough, uh, I found um, what I found the most was the common ground, at least in terms of our speakers. And that would uh, strike me as quite remarkable because they are all from different fields of work, from different institutions. So it seems there is this acknowledgement of uh, the role of the practitioner, of uh, how we can um, how we can grade uh, what is relevant, what makes for uh, accountable artistic research, and uh, how we can uh, why uh, the, uh, there is work that can just be undertaken uh, under the academic umbrella. In terms of that regard, I think. Um, we are in a moment that we need to grab precisely because it seems that there is a, pul a pulsation across departments, across European countries, that certain things are not operating in terms of allowing our institutions and our researchers in artistic research um, to, to reach their full potential in terms of the work they can undertake. And also uh, the relevance in terms of, as it was mentioned, uh, social cohesion and on so many levels to have um, this setup um, solid grounded in terms of academia and the importance that uh, fundraising has uh, for the development of this work. Uh, so we are uh, at the crossroads, I think, and where we need to establish um, solid directives and perspectives on the field so that work is taken as a work that is accountable, valid, fundamental, even for our understanding of ourselves as Europeans, uh, something that sometimes is not mentioned, um, it, it, and, and, and paramount for this construction of a cultural Europe. Uh, so, uh, so in the end, I think we, we need to be very positive because of uh, all of the speakers that share their knowledge um, the key, the key issues that uh, need to be overcome. It seems like they all uh, uh, are on the same page. So it's concessional. Certain basic uh, things that need to uh, need further development are concessional across institutions. Sure. I just, I was just thinking when I was a baby lecturer. So I had been a film student and then a filmmaker, and then I, then I started teaching by accident. I think a lot of people start teaching by accident. I didn't hear the word research for the first three or four years. And then research was something that was done by other people. And um, do, do you think, 
it's important that we start to look at embedding the idea of artistic research back into our undergraduate programs and to our, you know, our early, early career practice based lectures. Yes, uh, I think that's key. That's an, <laughs> that's an excellent question. I think it, uh, it, it really nails it, uh, Barry. Uh, myself, uh, a long time ago, I was also a, a film student all the way through my BA and MA. And I feel that sometimes feel, uh, film schools tend to be very focused in terms of practical work, practical knowledge, make documentaries, make fiction, uh, all on, uh, on a, basis, uh, a basis that outputs will always uh, be mainly focused on the practical without considering uh, as a major issue um, the theory around the materialities of the students, what they are doing. By this, I mean a student that learns cinematography, but learning um, the aesthetical reasons why he does some, some choices to have that closet at, uh, at their heart. And perhaps it's divided because I interview often, um, I, I'm, my, one of my interests is history of film and I interview practitioners uh, on the way they deal with the materialities and something that arises excellent professionals that just say, I don't know why, I, how I can explain why I do things, I do them. And it's this notion of a separation between uh, the head and the hand. And perhaps because for many times it was, uh, uh, we ha you had film studi students and that was connected with uh, humanities studies and not film schools. And those were the ones, the intellectuals that would develop uh, the boring stuff and would be going through film history and, and theory and so forth. So perhaps it's to uh, create ways uh, that in terms of how we teach and in our good practice of teaching, we give students as much pleasure and objects in terms of theory, their theory work as of their practical work so that we construct um, this notion of someone that is learning and is always joining the two. Because perhaps the problem is that uh, because of these counterpoints to film study courses, we went too much into the other direction and, and, um, and film history and all the theory uh, curricular units are something that are ticked, but not something that are perceived as something that will make them great filmmakers, great editors, and so forth. So if at Filmio, we join that from the start um, and create a momentum uh, from the BA, um, I'm optimistic that at the MA and at the PhD level, we will have uh, less problems in terms of students that can relate to both, that do not struggle with uh, methodologies and accountability and um, uh, reasoning in terms of how, why they go about things in a practical manner. Erica, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. And I wish you and your team uh, the best of luck who I all know and like and you've been busy and I expect you're going to be very busy over the next few months uh, but thank you very much for presenting to us today and we look forward to hearing from you again in the future. Okay thank you. Thanks. So finally I'd like to introduce Tobias uh, from Morgan from Lusophone University uh, who's going to speak on the, the methods and challenges in teaching transversal projects. Tobias is a filmmaker, educator and lecturer. At Lusophone, he is professor for Kinoise, the Erasmus Mundus MA in filmmaking, and the MA in film studies and the BA in cinema. He's the project supervisor on exchange programs like Looking China and research project, sorry, research programs like wow. Film Terms. He's currently developing his artistic PhD about creative artistic intelligence at the Film University in Babelsberg. His works include fiction, nonfiction, and experimental. His film Human Body was screened at more than 25 uh, film festivals worldwide, and among his editing works is the restoration and re-editing of Yilmaz Guni's uh, Yol, the full version, which premiered in Cannes in 2017. He also works as a story analyst uh, for international screenplays. You know, Tobias, take it away. Thanks, Barry. <laughs> Thanks, Erica, for the wonderful uh, speak uh, about PhD, because you also helped uh, in developing what I'm presenting here now, the transversal projects. Um, yeah, 
I want to speak about transversal projects, about the methods and the challenges uh, that these kind of projects uh, bring. My main focus in teaching um, lies in the crossroads between a theoretical and a practical filmwork with the students. And that's what I want to talk with you here today. The development of transversal projects. What are the steps of this? What are the rules? What do we want the students to learn? And what are the challenges and possible failures? I want to start um, sharing my screen with you. <clears throat> There we go. I yep, think we've got it can. there. Do you want to just try going forward and back just to make sure that works? I think yep, perfect. Works. Cool. <laughs> so um, this is what I'm going to speak with you today. I'm going to do a definition, an overview, the rules. I'm going to speak about the partners of this project, teaching methods, the team building aspects, the outputs, both the creative outputs and the written outputs how we evaluate these kind of projects and what we want the students to learn and what are possible challenges. And in the end, I'm gonna show you some examples of uh, depending on how much time we have. Let's define the word transversal. I mean, obviously it's a geometrical description and it means two lines crossing um, uh, one line, sorry, one line crossing two other lines. In an academic sense, a transversal project is a project that involves different disciplines from one course, so the cinema course, bringing together different hierarchies and different functions, or we call them also positions, and involves all the students in the course. Transversal also means to break down the complexity of the overall project and create and join different individual goals into one common goal. In our case, that is creating a mini series. So as you can see, it's by defi definition, a project of collaboration. I'm gonna stress upon the, the collaborative aspect later. I'm gonna give you an overview. In the second year of the film degree and the cinema course of Lusophona, a transversal or cross-curricular project is proposed to the students involving all subjects in their curriculum. The focus of the project is the development and production of a mini web series or a mini series, depending, with an associated transmedia component throughout the two semesters. The briefing, for this project is developed in partnership with different companies that partner every year with the university. General guidelines such as target audiences or budgets follow industry standards and are also set or co-set by the companies involved. Every year, a specific theme is defined as an umbrella for the development of the project. In the current uh, academic year, 2021, this theme was obviously contagion in the previous year, it was conflict. And in the year before, it was stories from and about the sea. The briefing at the beginning of the semester also states the focus in the current multi-platform distribution environments and in the narrative potential that these bring forth. So we want the students to develop a mini series with five episodes and each should be around eight minutes long. Only the pilot itself will be shot. However, it's required that each team develops the screenplays of all five episodes. We're trying to establish a writer's room situation with different responsibilities and strength of the students. During the first semester, the students are organized into small teams. They work on the ideas, on the concepts, on the exposés, on the synopsis, on the log lines. So the normal writing process of a series. They have to work together. There is no one writer and the others listening, but there is a collaborative writing process. <clears throat> After two months in December, a first pitching is conducted for the selection of the projects.
interesting theme of the year. <clears throat> the, the board of teachers also have in mind that So I'm wondering if I'm, if I, if, if Tobias is. I'm sorry, yes. I just want to check Tobias. I think you dropped out a little bit there. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking it's not for me. I'm thinking it's for everyone. So maybe oh, if you sorry. could pop back one slide. Yes, okay. Uh, like. <laughs> Am I back? Yeah, you're back. Hopefully, okay. hopefully you'll you'll stay with us. <laughs> I'd love to stay with you. Um, okay, I'm I'm going to go here. Uh, good. So, um, the, uh, as I said, the four selected projects continue their development by writing the screenplay of the pilot, or you can also call them the first episode because we have five, and the writing outlines for the other four episodes. That requirement is important to mention because all the 12 initial projects will have to write the screenplays for the five episodes and the whole series. No project dies at this point. It should be a fair chance to other students to be able to learn the development of a mini series. Because if we would not write the whole, uh, the whole uh, five episodes, two thirds of the students wouldn't have classes anymore. Because only you know we can't only stick to the four projects that go into production. We do this later at the beginning of the second semester. <clears throat> at the same time. Students start to organize themselves into teams. I'll reflect later on this team building process, how this is done. <clears throat> Some weeks later, a second pitch is conducted to present the completed screenplays and to oversee the team lists. Later, uh, well, again, some weeks later, we have a third pitch. So it's a con consecutive pitching here that the students really need to learn how to pitch, how to present themselves, how to present the project, which is a very important learning outcome as well. And this green light pitch is conducted to ev evaluate the status of readiness and feasibility of the, of the project, as well as the completion of the team, its motivation and its balance. The guests that are coming from the companies and that are participating in the projects take part in all these pitchings. They have ranged from broadcasters or production companies or alike. In parallel, during the semester, several master classes with professionals are conducted so that the students can learn several steps of the process with real perspectives. The articulation between all these elements should create a true simulation environment that puts the students through the challenges of hardship of a real audiovisual production. The selected projects, usually four, then produce a pilot episode of the show plus several transmedia extensions and present this in front of public at the end of the semester. So to sum up, this practice-based learning experience focuses on a collaborative project to create a multi-platform distribution narrative project. Starting from the given topics, teams develop a mini-series storyline and a cohesive audiovisual universe that expands from this. The work is audience-driven. The groups reflect both upon its best artistic form, as well as situate the project in the market and the client's needs. To achieve this, we have defined several rules. Our experience shows that the better and the clearer these rules are defined, the easier it is for the students. It's self-understood that this, these rules are only 
and even it's not a goal in themselves. However, the existence of a set of rules helps them to focus, it prevents them from struggling against an unknown system or so, but instead supports their creativity. I think that's true for, for art itself. And these rules also create fairness and equality between the students. As a chronological order, as you can see here, we have the idea development, and then the pitch, and then the proposal of the team, and then another pitch, as I said. We give them five days of shooting, we give them 14 days of picture editing, and we give them 14 days of sound, which is divided into 11 days of sound editing and three days of sound mix. And in the end, they need to do a final presentation in front of public. Some rules are, they get 600 euros from the university, but they're allowed to expand this by crowdfunding. I'll explain later how they do that. We are limiting the number of locations by two. We've been thinking about this rule for the past years, what's best to limit the projects in order to enhance their feasibility. So we were thinking, should we limit the length, what we do as well here with the eight minutes, or should we limit the number of actors, or what could be a possible, what, what is best to, 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 to make the project like working? And we came up with the idea that the, the locations is the crucial part because of all the production issues and also money and also the time. So they're only allowed to shoot on two different locations. Of course, some of these rules are more soft than others. For example, the duration is always actually higher than these eight minutes that you see here. But I think that's a question for all student projects and not specifically on transversal projects. <clears throat> I want to speak about the partners that I've mentioned. The partners, um, I'm going to show you here a brief briefing of one of these partners, what they would, what, how they see themselves and what they would like to have. Um, so they are, they want to create a laboratory, like going away from the traditional TV uh, shows and, 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 and so on, what's been going on in the past years. They want to experiment with new ways of storytelling. They want to discover new talents in, 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 in script writing and directing and editing and production, give them a chance, but also like make them uh, very early on uh, like attached to their company. They want to create these opportunities. They want to invest in a multi-platform content where the projects are born and live in the digital. And, you know, that's where everything is going on is obviously. And they want to increase their own content portfolio on these digital platforms. Speaking about a project, they would, for example, that's an example of, 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 of what, what one of these partners wishes. They want a fictional project, so no documentary. They want three to five episodes, and they must be, they have no pre-established length, but we do that for academic reasons. <clears throat> and their distribution must go on uh, different platforms, the company's own streaming platform, and of course, the usual suspects, Facebook and Instagram. And the stories of these two platforms may be the same or not, may be dependent or not. And you see what the audience they wish, 15 to 18 years old. And they also prefer comedy over melodrama or tragedy or something. They want something that is like, like cool, if you could sum it up in one word. So that's the partners um, that, uh, that the university has in this case, the second year. I'm going to speak about the teaching methods here. This cross-curricular project supervision is conducted by different teachers, each focusing on the areas, on their own areas of expertise and specialization. Specific mentoring sessions are organized for different stages of the production and different parts of the project, like the production design, the transmedia development, the multi-camera, the post-production, or the writing. These, we have two main subjects here. The one is called PAR, that's the Portuguese uh, abbreviation of techniques 
writing and directing. And here they learn how to create and write and direct and post produce a drama series. And so they overall learn the narrative aspect of the project. In the other atelier or in the other course, which is called AGPP, it's the atelier of managing projects and programs, they acquire the abilities to develop the production aspect and the commercial aspects of the project. They learn how to define a market, they learn how to define a target audience, they position themselves and the project in the market. They learn how to create schedules, their budgets, breakdowns, and all the other production aspects of, uh, of, of making films. And of course, they learn how to develop their own transmedia components. <clears throat> we have eight teachers that are directly involved in this development and in the production of the series. The students have additional courses during these two semesters, like for example, law uh, or Portuguese cinema, film history, fashion photography, film journalism, and so on. Since there are many teachers involved, that's the nature of a transversal project, right? Workflow documents had to be created. Guidelines that describe simple steps, especially when handing over from one department to another, step by step. This especially applies to processes where the technical aspect is crucial for the aspect of time and therefore for the amount of time that the students have for their own creative work. One other aspect I'd like to mention is the role of the director. There is a long discussion about this position ever since, let's say, you know, Nouvelle Vague or you name it, this auteur driven approach of making films. This is no longer the case nowadays. And we clearly want to leave this auteur driven path and follow the more modern path of a team based film where the director is one amongst others, of course, making creative decisions, but not in a hierarchical way, but in a team based way. We have a showrunner, we have a writer's room, we have a creative producer who is able to form a team and connect uh, the, the production aspects with the creative aspects. So we want the hierarchies, as good as it gets, to be abolished. Let's speak about the team building. The team building process is one that is very important for the students themselves. It is one where the supervisors, the teachers, have the least insight because it's a social process, actually. In average, the students in the second year, bachelors, we have around 70 students per year. That's a lot. And so they need to split up on these four projects uh, that go into production. And they are later joined by 10 to 20, depending, sound students from the sound course in Lusophona. In total, we have defined 53 positions for the whole project from a showrunner, production team, directing team, the, the, the image department, sound department, art department, you know, the usual, um, uh, the usual teams, and also a distribution and promotion department. The students are required to build the teams themselves. We have tested this model. Um, we have tested this model throughout the years. And we found out that this organic process of self-organization with a slight supervision from the teachers is the best for the project. When I say organic, I mean in the best social way possible. Because sometimes the students need to pitch themselves. They need to say, hey, I, am, I, I can do the subtitles or I, I want to do uh, the EPK or I, I, I'm an assistant editor, so can't, I, I want to do this. Our approach is that we set rules and we make the students participate in at least two projects in different roles in different departments so that they have an overview of the whole filmmaking process. We have created a set of primary roles like director or a cinematographer or an editor um, and secondary roles like a production assistant or all the assistants and so on. With the goal of a balance, of numbers of positions that each student has. So you need to have three positions, but you cannot take seven positions, which is also, you know, some students want this and that's good, but we need to take care of the whole year. This process is not always easy because it requires actions from the students him or herself to find a place. We don't give them the place, they need to find this place. 
it's an exercise for life after all, or at least for working in the film industry. Since we don't have any specializations in the course, um, but only the overall discipline called cinema, the students are required to fulfill a variety of different tasks. In their first year, the previous year, uh, they had classes that we call ateliers, like editing or camera or light or sound and so on. And the second year, the time is over for exercises and we go into transversal projects where they can apply this. We thrive to mix the learning experience as best as possible. So it's the second year, so they still have to, the chance to try things out. They are often they are students after all, so I very often encourage them to take positions that they never had before, to try out the other side, to step from the dark into the light or the other way around, to like leave the comfort zone. This is not an easy process with 70 students. What do we want the students to learn? Well, I, I, sorry, what do we want the students as an output? At the end of the semester, the teams deliver a whole package. We stress on their effort to go way beyond the actual story of the mini series, but to create a universe of this series. We strongly encourage the project to be innovative in format, in technology, in platforms, in genres, and of course, in the content itself. The students use social media platforms for promoting their work. Historical, historically, this also offers an overview of the common goal of these social platforms. Only a few years ago, Facebook was everybody's choice number one, but today nobody doesn't even mention Facebook anymore in our controversial projects. Not sure why. Maybe that's a generation problem. Also. Some students try out Twitter or SoundCloud or Mixcloud, of course, YouTube. Uh, we're still waiting for somebody using TikTok or Clubhouse now or whatever new apps emerge, like Spotify's new green room or whatever there is on the market. But this, the university stays neutral to these students' choices because we don't encourage or discourage any of these platforms. Only we want them to expand their, their, uh, their universe. The package they have to deliver. It's the pilot of the series, obviously with the length of around eight minutes. The screenplay of the pilot, as well as the other four screenplays, so five screenplays, and the Bible of the series. I think everybody's familiar with what a Bible is. It's the overview. It's like more or less, a, let's say, a 30 pages document, a Bible where they describe the universe, the characters, and so on of, the, of, of, of their series. And we have the transmedia part. You see here, a 90 seconds IGTV version of the pilot. So what's this? Uh, IGTV means uh, Instagram TV. So it's a vertical, not a horizontal like the pilot, but a vertical output, a vertical film, 90 seconds long, where they stress upon the, the, the limits of this medium. So they cannot use landscape, for example, but they can only use characters uh, that, have, uh, that are in a certain frame in a certain way. <clears throat> and they put this on Instagram. They are. They must also deliver a trailer, a making of, an Instagram page or a gallery, a photo gallery. Instagram is just the easiest way to do it, but they can do it anywhere. They should do a website and they can do it extras like a soundtrack or a VR, a game, podcast on Spotify, a spin-off of their series. You know? And they also have to deliver a production dossier containing production reports, the timeline of the project, the shooting schedule, the dailies, the budget. You know. They must give us references and the mood board. They must have obviously the cost list and the team list and statements uh, why, the, why they want to make this film, what's their own goal. And overview of the production design, right? And they have a promotional dossier, which is the concept of promoting the film, looking for the target audience, looking for the timeline of the release date. They cannot release everything, you know, like, but they, they, do, uh, they do a certain schedule here. And they also includes posters, stills, the trailer here, and the IGTV version, the CVs. So 
it's a package for promoting your film. And each of these dossiers is, depending, 50 or 80 pages long. The, um, as I mentioned before, the budget is 600 euros. And so the students are allowed, or they, are, they can do that, uh, have a crowdfunding of their project. They mostly use these Portuguese crowdfunding platform called PPL, um, which is an which is an all nothing model. So if you reach the goal, you get it, and if not, uh, nothing has ever happened. It's seven percent fees, um, and um, in twenty twenty one, in the actual year, all of the four projects that we're doing right now were co-financed there between one hundred and one hundred forty percent. So it's 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 uh, they they are they have enough money to do the film. How do we evaluate our students? The student's assessment is balanced between the quality of the series uh, or the pilot and the corresponding production and promotion packages, as well as their auto-evaluation report on goals and achievement. It's a mix of, so it's a mix of a project grade and an individual grade. And the external partners' feedback that are always there in the, in the pitching sessions complete this evaluation. However, it needs to be said that they are not part of the grade. They are external feedback. And as you can see in the writing, in the directing course, where 40% of the screenplays and 45% of the film and the participation of the student. In the other course, um, all these packages and dossiers and reports are equal 25%. What do we want the students to learn here? We are having a commercially driven artistic output. That's what we want them to create. And you see maybe the friction between commercially driven and artistic output, or is there a friction? That's the question. The main results of the project include the setup of a simulation environment that mimics real world production and development condition and the implementation of a learning process Developing the project allows the students to understand and apply all the different competences that are needed during the different production stages. The educational impact includes reinforcement of teamwork skills, interaction with professionals and companies in an educational protected setting, and the actual development uh, of the artistic outputs. The focus on distributing these projects and not only writing and then shooting them also infuses the students an understanding of how the market conditions can affect the creative process. We have a large number of outputs and uh, as you see, we have the five screenplays, we have the pilot, we have all the package of the transmedia components. So that's a huge task for the students. Let's speak about the challenges this might, that they might have. Because I want to do a critical reflection also about this method and this kind of project. One of the Bias, biggest challenges. Uh, just, just to interrupt you slightly, just we're, we're, we're beginning to run a little short of time. So if you, if you want questions, um, you'll need to maybe make sure that we plow through, if that's OK. OK. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. I'm Sorry for disturbing you. No, OK, thanks. Perfect. I'm going to do uh, two more minutes on the, on the challenges, right? Uh, Okay. So the team building challenges. Uh, these are um, uh, it, it, it's a social process between the students, as I said. They need to present themselves with their interests, with their passions, with their abilities, but also with their disabilities. What they don't know, they need to accept defeats, maybe even in public, and they need to take learn how to take a stand for something. So. Am I a leader? Am I a follower? What is my favorite position in filmmaking? What are the group's needs? What are the projects needs? And can they be mine? This gives them the chance to take responsibility. And this all needs guidance of the, of the teachers. The same goes for the integration of all the other different courses in the, in, in the project, like the sound course, or maybe even the animation course, or external help, like, like SFX. Due to the different demands of each of them, there are possible sources of friction. Most of the time, it's a communication challenge uh, and the need of saying, what do you need, what I need? And we as teachers need to provide a platform for this. 
I think due to time, I'm going to skip the consequences of COVID <laughs> because we all have been reflecting about this. Uh, I have to say that the digital world and the real world are different ones, of course, and the challenges here and there are different. Uh, but I want to go, um, I want to speak about uh, my golden rule in the team building process, and that is no one's left behind. We have to have each student on board, even the ones that tend to hide and or that tend to, that are not like the front row, but you know, in the back seats, they need to be considered as well. And um, we need to find a balance there. So I think, as I said before, we need the, the more clear the structure is, the better I think it's for the students. Here's just a recap of what I've been telling you, like what the transversal project are and collaborative project and the supervised learning and the market driven work and the peer learning and the team building experience. I'm happy to show you some examples also, but first I'm gonna take your questions. Brilliant, Tobias. I'm not sure we'll have time to show examples, but what okay. we might do is we might post them on the website so that people can see it, and that that will be will help my cunning plan of sending people to the website. And um, just the, the first question up, I think you answered was 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 about not leaving any students behind. So we'll we'll skip that one. Um, what kind of partners are involved? So Brett, Brett Van Hook wants to know what kind of partners involved are they? Broadcasters, telecoms, production houses. And what do they want to get out of it as well, I suppose? Oh, yeah, they are like, uh, they are partners, Portuguese partners, uh, like television, RTP, and, and so forth, and other uh, television companies seek. What they want to get out is actually content. Uh, they are there to, 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 to see what the students do and take that, bring that to their own uh, media think, you know, to their own play, um, which means uh, they, have, they have new material, not very expensive one, considered the, the amount of uh, euros per minute. And uh, they wanna, uh, sometimes they suggest these students to, uh, to, to go forth uh, with another project in the future, uh, which, you know, how many students do they take? Do they take the whole team or do they only take the creative heads and do they take all of the creative heads? That's a discussion that's open still. But uh, these are these are the partners that that uh, are, and that's a, that's a tradition already in, in Lusophone. Yeah, okay, super. And I I noticed that you you avoided the word film, um, it, and you used the word project and a few other different different words for it. Is that deliberate? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It's uh, yeah, I, I do because I have to emphasize this because I make this uh, mistake on my own on my own because we're not doing a film. We're not doing a short film. I mean, if, if in, in that strict sense of the word, because we're doing a mini series, you could call them a mini web series. Uh, the mini only is because of the length, you know, uh, a web series or a series, but we're not doing a short film. The next, the year after they're doing a short film, but the, the, the cinematic language of a series is so much different from a, 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 a short films that you would see on a festival and that's why I stress so much on this because often in their presentations they give us like mood boards and examples the references of films like and then okay here you go of films you know and then you say I want to do it like uh, Antonioni or so but nothing wrong about Antonioni you know but that's not the universe they should they should learn at this stage uh, but it's more about the newest series by uh, by Nicholas Winding Refn or Mr. Rapper, or you name them, you know that. Uh, but this is the universe they should live in, another another short film universe. So, I mean, I suppose just following on from that, in terms of uh, their perspective, the student perspective, what what do you think are the biggest challenges? Uh, I think that this team building process is the biggest challenge, and uh, and to. <sighs> To do one thing for to do this project for two semesters, that's not easy because if you do an exercise and you you know that's that's for 
three weeks or something. But if you do this whole universe for the whole semester and you choose a position in the beginning that you maybe dislike or that you found out that you dislike, uh, that's a big challenge. Um, that's a big challenge for the students. And this constant need for pitching, uh, which we really, uh, uh, try, they need to do it because later they need to do it and they need to present their films. Here we go again with the films on festivals in a Q&A session or something. But it's hard because, you know, it's also it's focusing on pitching can be a danger because then you focus only on the aspect that sounds very good or, you know, the love lines that have create metaphors in the audience's head, but you, but you don't really, you're not really new to the project, uh, but uh, you, you don't go deep into the project. And that's, uh, that's, um, that's, that's a challenge. And the other challenge I would say is, is the, but that's not uh, specific to transversal it's the challenge between the technical requirements and the artistic output and how do i see myself in all this uh, uh, um, uh, as a as a filmmaker and where is the audience you know wh wh who am i making films series for i think that's a it's a brilliant question for for filming you in particular as we as we move forward um I'm going to have to wrap it up there because we, we, we've run out of time um, mm -hmm. and, and I, want, I want to thank you a lot. I think what we might do is you've got some examples. We might put them on the, the Film EU um, page and certainly the Film EU Facebook page. If anyone, as you mentioned, still uses Facebook, I'm old <laughs> enough that I, I still find that information from, from Facebook. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. We're, we're back at 2 p.m. Central European time or 3 p.m. Sorry. 2 p.m. Western European time and 3 p.m. Central European time, essentially 90 minutes uh, after lunch for a round table on visualizing the impossible. Um, and then we will have a session on measuring the impact of cinema sound effects uh, on audience and key paradigms. We're going to ask you guys, the audience to do, do me a favor. If you could go to filmeu.eu, uh, scroll down to the bottom of the page and hit subscribe to Film EU, you'll get, you'll get all our messages. We're only we're only starting out, we're six months into this. As I said, we've been partners for quite a while, but we're only six months into this particular project. We have a very, very busy schedule over the next number of years, and we'd like you to be part of it. And um, so if you could, and Anna's pop popped it into a chat. Um, the other thing is that we have a Facebook page, we've got Twitter, we've got Instagram. And um, so, so if you, since it's a long enough lunch break, maybe do me a favor and take two minutes to just subscribe to some of those channels. Um, but for me, thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you later.
Good afternoon and welcome back. I hope that you enjoyed your lunch. My name is Hannah Dick and I'm the international coordinator of Lucas School of Arts in Brussels and of course part of FilmEU. Kickstarting our afternoon program, there are two main topics we will be addressing, visual arts and sound and media. You will have a chance to grab a coffee during the break, which will take place at four. We have three speakers who will be presenting their research pertaining to the visual arts and discussing how their artistic research relates to visual effects. <laughs> the discussion and the Q&A afterwards will be moderated by Dr. Steven Malit, who is a lecturer and researcher at Lucas School of Arts in Genk, where he teaches meaningful play and art-based research. Our first speaker is Alexandra Krauers, who is a visual artist, lecturer, and doctoral researcher in art and animation at Lucas School of Arts in Brussels. She investigates artistic methods and how to deal with ecological grief. Her works arrive in the digital realm, in which nature simulations such as Habitat Diorama and science fiction play important roles. Our second speaker is Hiro de Vader. Hiro lectures at the animation department of Lucas School of Arts in Brussels and scrutinizes proto-cinematic apparatus and their potential impact on the creation of post-cinematic loops. This allows him to investigate ontology of repetition. His work is deeply rooted in digital creation methods and seeks to understand analog analogization through a reinterpretation of obsolete media. Our third and, third and last speaker is Gert Wasteen, who is a Belgian audiovisual artist. He currently lectures at Lucas School of Arts in Genk as a member of the animation department and is currently working on his doctoral research, which focuses on artistic and performative artifacts created with extended reality within the field of animation. I will now pass the mic to Steven Malit. Um, yes, thank you very much, Hanna, uh, for this nice introduction of all of us. Maybe a clarification before I start, we put the order of the speakers there alphabetically, but we are animation people and we like to make things complicated. So we will, uh, we will do a lineup with in the reverse order of the speakers. So we will Perfect. start with Gert, uh, after Gert. Guido will uh, take the word and the top of the bill for today is Alexandra Krauers. Um, but yes, you'll notice that as we go along. First of all, I'm super proud to be part of this impressive lineup and also very proud that the kind of research that they do is hosted within the context of Luca. It shows that we um, have a very fruitful culture for research and that we have high quality researchers who constantly look forward, look towards future innovations that can be done with their medium. Um, besides the fact that they are PhD researchers at LUCA um, and that their research deals with animation in some kind of way, um, I think there's another remarkable similarity between the three speakers of today. And that is that they approach animation or animation film as half an insider and half an outsider. And um, all three of them have some or even extensive uh, experience as animation filmmakers, but at the same time have a large experience in other arts. Um, and they bring along their expertise from these other uh, arts into their animation film practice and research. And as a consequence of this, I think they all the three of them have like a unique, a very fresh perspective uh, on the on the medium of animation. And it's also something that um, almost by coincidence uh, ties them together and makes makes them like a great trio to have as speakers uh, together for this afternoon. So yeah quite a bit of reasons why I'm happy and proud to be part of this very interesting company we have for this afternoon. So yeah, as I think my role here will just be to um, talk a bit through everything, um, but the main spotlight will be on these three very interesting people. Um, before we get started, maybe we should also say that there will be time for discussion afterwards. 
Um, and so if you, if you have questions, we will, we will invite you or encourage you to post them on the chat here or on YouTube. And only at the end, we will get to your questions because there's such a consistency between the three talks. I think it's better to not interrupt each talk with questions, but just we will consider the questions and deal with them in the end. So if we don't respond to your questions right away, it's not because we're not interested. It's because we think that the end is, is, is the right place to have a discussion with all three of them. So I'll remark um, in regard to the questions, please ask them during the talk in the chat because there's like a delay in the YouTube um, between the Zoom and the YouTube. So don't wait till the end to send them in the chat, just send them immediately and we will respond to them later on. Voilà. Okay, thank you. So then the first speaker, the last on the bill in alphabetical order is Gert Wastein, who um, works at Campus C-Mine in Genk, um, where he is a, a member of the Interactions Research Group and where he teaches in, I think, almost all programs. They have game design, product design, animation film, um, photography, I think. Um, and his research deals with how we can use virtual reality as a production environment for animation. And more specifically, he aims to bring practices like improvisation or like the relationship between the artist and the material, the, the tangible nature of some arts, he aims to bring that into the craft of making animation. And he experiments with using VR to accomplish these kind of things. Um, I've seen a bit of what he's been doing. It's super interesting and I'm quite sure he can talk about it a lot better than me. So please Gert, take the floor and the word is yours. Okay, thank you, Steven and Hannah, for that introduction. Uh, I hope I have a lot of stuff to say after that. <laughs> um, I'm going to share my screen uh, and uh, go to uh, the presentation. So uh, my background is uh, in 2D illustration and animation. I've been uh, active as a VJ and uh, making visuals for uh, theater and mixed media events. Uh, as Anna said and Steve said, I am uh, part of the teaching staff at Lucas School of Arts in Genk, Belgium, uh, where I am also a researcher at Interactions. Um, the name extended, real, uh, extended animation derives from uh, extended uh, reality. My aim is to uh, explore the uh, possibilities that arise from using extended uh, reality and at this point of the research more uh, and, uh, virtual reality as a production tool or as an artistic tool within the field of animation film. Uh, at the moment, we've been foremost uh, working uh, looking at uh, the concept art phase, storyboarding phase and 3D modeling phase and to see uh, where we can implicate, uh, implement, implement the VR and the, or XR tools there. Um, but extended is not only uh, a term that is used for extended reality, but also for the extended life. Uh, that is uh, something that has always been uh, uh, very present in my work. I've been fascinated with uh, incarnations of, of art, the many uh, steps that can the, that a life cycle of a piece of art can go through. For instance, it's always been present even at my, uh, my graduation work. This, uh, you can see here, is a small bit of it. It was actually a performance where I used uh, found footage and I uh, chemically treated it and, and did the scratch animations on it. And it was uh, presented in a performance way where a composer played a piece of music and that decided through uh, the use of uh, MIDI signals in which way, in which way the, the scenes were ordered. But it was interesting to see uh, the different kinds of uh, uh, phases the, 
the work went through. And it started out as, as a documentary that I used or, or even pieces of film reel that I used. And, I, and then it was put on the editing table. Then, I, then it was more material uh, that I can uh, use to uh, make physical uh, alterations to. Then it was digitized. So it had a digital form. Then it was uh, incorporated in a performance. Now it is incorporated in a presentation of Film AU. So it's uh, fascinating to see which kinds of forms uh, this uh, work can take. And it's a bit of a uh, reoccurring theme in my work. So uh, also the performative aspect, uh, aspect uh, is very important in my work. When you look at uh, the work I've been doing was uh, mostly uh, very uh, uh, based on deciding what to do on the, in the moment itself. In VJing, this is very normal to uh, make your edits on the fly and make compositions on the fly. But also with theater, there is a, a, a very uh, um, performative aspect there. Um, I've started out, as I said, uh, with more uh, 3D modeling as a base to see where we can use uh, virtual reality as a, as a tool um, in the animation pipeline. Um, I've been working on a project called the Carbon Cycle, where they needed uh, a lot of 3D models fairly quickly. Um, the only thing is I, I'm not really a 3D artist, I'm more a 2D artist. So for me, working with 3D uh, software was always a bit cumbersome. I didn't find it intuitive at all. Everything was hidden behind walls of menus. So the thing with working with virtual reality is it was very, I've been using Gravity Sketch. It's a program that's very intuitive. And in no time we had like tons of models. Okay, it's low poly, so it's not that detailed, but we had uh, the rapid prototyping of this uh, medium, uh, the rapid prototyping abilities are very, uh, very interesting to see. Um, of course, uh, I had to test this uh, live during the Day of Science in Belgium. This is a day where people can come and uh, experience uh, some kind of scientific uh, field. This was also about the carbon cycle where students and people could suggest which kinds of models are still missing from the carbon cycle. And I had like 15 minutes to model a, a drilling platform or a car. So there again, it was very uh, interesting to see how fast my ideas could be generated into uh, digital art. Uh, even the first steps into this modeling was already uh, very uh, interesting to see how fast uh, I could get used to the medium. Uh, of course, I have a bit of experience as an, as an illustrator. So it was interesting to see what uh, would happen if I would uh, teach what I've already learned to students that are not necessarily from animation. These uh, were classes that I did. This is a workshop VR to 3D print where we had students of a lot of disciplines, uh, designers, uh, architects, even clothing designers. And they were given the same tools I had and they, whatever they made, they were going to make a 3D print. And in most of the cases, all students were very fast in learning the medium and had got interesting results, like nice results even. Um, then, uh, no, this is not that. Okay, I, I did try the same thing on uh, animation students. Um, and uh, what was there, what was, uh, Interesting there was that uh, most students that weren't 3D students, they were uh, very quick to adapt to this new medium for them. And there were two students that are uh, like very, very good 3D artists. And uh, they struggled, they struggled because they had their workflow already. And they, uh, they really found it hard to adapt to uh, another workflow. So these are a bit, uh, results, they had three hours to make these, uh, these designs. I'm not gonna go through all of them because I don't have that much time, 
but I, I thought it was really interesting to see how quickly uh, they could uh, produce these results. Um, so the next step in my research is to uh, try to incorporate the more performative part of my research into uh, uh, video mapping. I want to uh, externalize the, uh, the results that I have already uh, uh, had on my research and try to externalize the internal world of the VR experience and, and map them on a building so people more than one person can experience it, not necessarily on a screen, but more of in a immersive uh, experience for, for like a crowd. Hopefully now that COVID is uh, getting a bit more loose uh, with the restrictions, that might be possible. Um, in this project, we are uh, trying to uh, also work with co-creation. I'm working with artists in Germany and they're uh, going to work on the same illustration as me. We're going to make an, a light painting in a uh, tilt brush. And we're going to work on the same illustration that is improvised on live music um, while looping and animating the build-up process of uh, this uh, illustration. There's also a, a reaction of the music on the colors and the movement. So in effect, whatever we are making, whatever illustration that we are making that day uh, guides the music and the building uh, sort of speak becomes a visual musical instrument. So uh, a lot of things will be decided on the day, on the moment itself. Um, okay, uh, I, I went to it fairly quickly. If there are uh, questions about my research, uh, I will see them uh, in the chat. I'm going to uh, uh, give uh, the word back to uh, Steven Malit. Um, thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Gert, uh, for this presentation that shows the kind of versatile and heterogeneous artist and researcher that you are. And we are definitely looking forward to that Painting with Light project. If I'm correct, it'll be in October or when will This is yeah, exactly. This will be in November 30th, 13th, actually, the weekend of November 13th. Okay, we are all going to write that down already because everybody's welcome, I think, to participate. Yes, yes. you have to register. The link will be up soon, uh, but it's free. And as long as you register, you can come and experience it. All right, thank you so much. Um, so as for the next speaker, uh, I'm glad to introduce uh, Guido de Vader. Um, like Gert, Guido also has one foot in animation film and also a strong foot in other disciplines, most notably visual storytelling, graphic, uh, graphic novels. And from that perspective, he also brings in an interest in media archaeology um, into current investigation of animation film. And more specific, he has a sort of a fascination for mechanical tools and devices that people used used to use uh, in the old days of animation, um, like the zoetrope and all all other sorts of uh, of related uh, constructions, just to make it physically happen that moving images could be recorded, and the collection of all these different interests that he has um, makes also that he has a very original and um, innovative take on the medium of animation. And like with Gert previously, I am sure Guido is able to talk about it a lot better than me. So Guido, the floor is yours. OK. Um... Thank you, Steven, for introducing me. And also uh, thank you all on the other side of the screen for being here with us this afternoon. So my name is Guido de Valere. I'm affiliated to the animation department on campus uh, St. Lucas Brussel. Uh, and I'm also a researcher in the uh, intermedia research unit on the same campus. Media archaeology is the central perspective to my research uh, investigating uh, moving images and more specifically animated loops. Um, although I have a background in uh, graphic storytelling, as Steven already said, um, the computer was always my primary tool for making animation. 
And this started out very early. So I started out at the age of nine or 10 in the mid eighties by um, making code based and also of course loop based animations on the Commodore 64 computer, which is by now of course also an object of study for media archeology. span But my dexterity with computers ultimately um, gave me the opportunity to um, join the technical staff at audiovisual arts uh, soon after graduating, where I um, helped the students with their digital post-production with uh, Premiere, uh, Avid, uh, Photoshop, After Effects. And my job also gave me access to the storage rooms uh, on our campus. And it's there that I found my true vocation because um, they were filled up with all kinds of um, uh, analog so-called obsolete technology. And soon I started working on film, on 16 millimeter film, making drawn on film animation, also known uh, as direct animation. Um, and this changed my perspective on the medium of animation completely as um, this medium allows you, uh, contrary to traditional animation, contrary to um, traditional film, to transgress the frame border. So if you take a strip of 16 millimeter film, if you, what you also saw, saw uh, with uh, Gert's early work, uh, you can draw a line, um, a vertical line across the film strip. And this generates spatial data, but when you put it on the editing table, it transforms into um, uh, uh, temporal data. Of course, 60 millimeter film has its limits, uh, especially when it comes to making representational animation, the, the frame size is very small. Um, and to overcome this limitation, I looked for uh, a hybrid analog digital solution, which I found in the film strip format by Adobe. This allowed me to work uh, to draw and paint on a larger format to scan these film strips uh, into Photoshop and then immediately transform them into moving images uh, using After Effects. Here is a very small fragment from Dependa, which is a multi-screen installation I made in 2011, rather finished in 2011. So um, if you would be interested in the film strip format, um, unfortunately, it doesn't exist anymore. So uh, it's, uh, it's was in, uh, it was uh, used actually not for making drawn-off film animation, but its, it's uh, intended use was for uh, compositing. Um, and as such, Adobe discontinued it as from CS5. So um, unfortunately, it's no longer there. Um, but um, my interest for the uh, interactions between the analog past and the digital present um, was awakened. And I, I increasingly uh, sought out different wormholes in media history, which brought me to the Fenachistiscope, um, which is um, almost two centuries old. So it was invented in 1832. Um, but regained a lot of attention in the past decades as these uh, Fenachistiscope discs were digitized and published on the internet as animated GIF files. So contrary to other devices, uh, such as the um, uh, probably better known zoetropes or praxinoscopes, um, these uh, Fenachistiscope discs were actually uh, shown on the internet, not as a still image, but as an animation. And as such, were rediscovered by a generation, younger generation of artists, uh, including myself, of course. Uh, here's an example from 1833, um, which looks like this in animation. So it looks really intricate and modern. Um, but the way we perceive these animations on a screen as an animated GIF file is actually a lot different than when you would uh, see them on the original devices. These are um, laser cut 
Fenakistiscope discs we used for a workshop on our campus. Um, so uh, in the original Fenakistiscope, you have to uh, peer through the slots into a mirror to see the animation, which of course gives you a lot of flicker and this um, limits the uh, kind of imagery you can use uh, to a large extent. So uh, your images have to be high in contrast, low in detail to uh, gain good animated results. Um, when you make these phenakistoscopes digitally, you don't have these limitations. So in the um, uh, digital reinterpretations, not only by me, this is an example by me, but also by other artists, um, the images are a lot more detailed. And um, this has a very peculiar side effect as um, if you look at this animation, for instance, um, it technically only lasts for 15 frames. So one second, but that's not enough to grasp the animation. So there um, is kind of a discrepancy between um, the time you need to really make sense of the animation and the, strictly speaking, the playback time. So for this, I uh, propose a term expanded loops uh, because you can only see these animations. You can only make sense of these animations as loops, not as linear film. Um, apart from existing on a computer screen, you can also uh, use the same principle to make animated installations <clears throat> by uh, using an externally synchronized shutter. Uh, this can be a strobe light as, for instance, is being used by Gregory Barsamian, or it can be um, an externally synchronized camera as in the work of Eric Dyer or John Edmark. As soon as you use an external shutter, uh, the difference between phenakistoscope and a zoetrope ceases to exist. So it actually creates a new medium, bridging technology from uh, 200 years ago, almost 200 years ago, and uh, contemporary technology. So the uh, small example uh, we're going to see next uh, from fossilized project from earlier this year um, is made using 3D animation, um, using a Formaps printer, which is a, um, a high-grade resin-based printer, uh, which is also used for medical applications. Here's a small fragment. And um, uh, this poses a very important question. So the, the quintessential element in, in seeing a moving image as moving image uh, is the shutter. Uh, without a shutter, you don't see a moving image. And um, that's very clear if you uh, make installations with these 3D prints, because if you look at them without mediation, without um, uh, an external shutter device, all you can see is um, motion blur. So um, something magical actually happens if you peer through uh, or, or if you watch on uh, a smartphone camera screen, then the animation suddenly pops to life. And that poses questions on uh, the perception of moving images, which is still quite mysterious. There's still debate of, um, uh, is uh, the persistence of vision uh, causing the um, uh, perception of moving images or not? And also, what is the real image? Because uh, is the real image the, the actual physical object, which is full of motion blur, or is the real image the image which you see on the screen and which only exists on the screen? Um, which is, of course, a very important question in a question in our uh, current society, where um, which is being more and more mediated, and where questions of what is real uh, is getting more and more uh, important. Here's uh, yet another small fragment from a project I did earlier this year, um, a quite philosophical project called Status Continuous.
Further research will focus on the integration of audio as um, both the historical devices as the current uh, contemporary reinterpretations are often uh, or mostly without sound or mute. Um, and loops are also quintessential to music. And my further research will focus on the integration of uh, audio of music uh, and image uh, in uh, the same at the same time. Um, last short example uh, is called Rotator is a first experiment in uh, 3D printing a record groove. Um, so where the, the image and the sound are actually one. So the uh, sound you hear um, is uh, a combination of the original intended sound of the noise that came out of the record player and of a rooster somewhere in a garden uh, next to ours, which was very distressed, um, which concludes my talk. Um, I thank you all very much for listening and I'll hand you over back to Steven again. Thank you very much, Hido. Um, yes, it's nice to see um how people nowadays are still embracing the old almost like hacker mentality of the early years trying to use the the material of animation film and use it for things that, that it was not intended to be used for and uh see what comes out of that and to see that tradition going on is, is fascinating and i'm really <laughs> looking forward to the next steps i think adding sound could be uh could make it even more impressive than what, what it already is going on at the moment. Um, so thanks a lot. And our last speaker for this afternoon or for this session will be Alexandra Krauers. Uh, Alexandra is like Hido, a researcher at St. Lucas Brussels campus of Luca, um, where she does research at the Intermedia uh, Research Unit. Um, Alexandra also approaches animation film from beyond or from a different perspective. Uh, and she comes from the fine arts or the liberal arts. And if, if you already thought that Hido's talk was a bit philosophical, I think she, all, she still brings in even more of a philosophical approach and also even more of a experimental uh, free to go approach. And, um, I think that is one of the, the aspects that makes um, her research on, for instance, loop animations so interesting that it, that it can seem to go in all kinds of different directions and that it really redefines um, animation as like an artistic medium and that's super nice to see. But again, Alexandra, you can, you, you can talk about this much better than me. Uh, so uh, yes, here's the word for you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I am uh, going to talk a little bit about the manipulation of time and space in my digital animations and multi-screen video installations. Um, I would like to start out first with a shout out to this really wonderful book um, from 2004, The Vatican to Vegas, A History of Special Effects by Norman E. Klein which is at places unreadable, but has some very interesting ideas concerning scripted spaces. Um, Klein connects the Baroque altars and churches to special effects used in films, notably 2001 A Space Odyssey, as a form of electronic Baroque. Uh, he considers physical and cinematic space as scripted spaces, guiding or manipulating cleverly the onlooker towards the experience of a certain architectural narrative. We also know this practice from supermarket products layout, for instance. In my case, I've always been inspired to travel back in time even further, and I consider the decorated prehistoric, prehistoric caves that were mentioned also this morning, for instance, Altamira, Chauvet, and of course, Lascaux as equally scripted. The purposes and layout of prehistoric caves vary per cave, 
but I look at at least some of those as simulations of mental space. And uh, there are two books that connect that idea. So I don't know if you can see those. The Mind Inside the Neolithic Mind and The Mind in the Cave by David Lewis Williams and David Pierce. So how does a filmmaker or someone like me working in the virtual X, Y, and Z axis of 3D animation simulate or convey a mental space? In this case, immersion is key. I've avoided using virtual reality so far due to the clunkiness of the headset and the lack of a real shared viewing experience. However, at the moment, I'm considering to experiment with VR anyway as a way to transport a real world location anywhere, basically. Um, this concerns a hectare of land, a form of forest, a victim of climate change, which plays an important part in my PhD research at the moment. I'm using photogrammatic 3D models to map that area, but I will get back to my current research later. Instead of VR, I'm often using multiple screens or long loops as a method to keep the viewer engaged. Long loops are slow, seamless works, ideally presented in a black box. Through trial and error, I'm looking for a sweet spot of velocity, a certain tempo that is slow enough to have an almost hypnotic effect, but fast enough to trap the viewer in the work or world I'm presenting. So, these loops are sometimes part of larger installations, but they can also be standalone and they function as a means to keep the audience in the space as long as possible and keeping the audience hostage. In practice, a 10 minute seamless loop often keeps the viewer trapped in the work for over 30 minutes, provided there's a comfortable place to sit, which is why I like to have pillows or other types of soft seating in the uh, exhibition space. I'm, in short, manipulating the viewer's perception of time. In the visual arts, manipulation is not a very bon-ton term to use, since art is often associated with something unspoiled and honest. But since the word artificial bears art in it, I don't really want to be hypocritical about it and just call it what it is. What you can see here is a loop from the three trend <laughs> Three channel work inertia, which is a homage to dystopian science fiction. This loop shows the slow coming to life of a mountainous, land mountainous landscape in a display case. It's a diorama scene. It refers to dioramas as habitat dioramas in natural history museums, the simulated landscapes that are confined to these cases, but also to the earliest dioramas by. Daguerre and Bouton, which were slowly moving paintings in the 19th century. So in this scene, which builds up first and then falls into despair, and then the cycle starts over again. The main film of Inertia is a 10 minute narrative. The two long loops that are connected to it provide extra space and context but also an incentive for the viewer to stay longer in the work than only 10 minutes, encouraging them to undergo the main film again and again and again. Inertia can be found on my website or in, on YouTube, by the way. Inertia talks about a vanished civilization which has left a deserted planet, and I used to describe my work as well, the core business of my work is escapism. The worlds I'm presenting the viewer with used to connect to the genre of science fiction and are often set in post-apocalyptic spheres. However, <laughs> this work is called The Archive. Due to the upheaval of the pandemic and the ongoing realization of the gravity of the climatological and ecological crisis, my works have inadvertently become part of actuality. And in a way, my work has become some sort of activism as opposed to escapism. This work here, the archive from 2017, is a sort of virtual diorama, an isolated island where the viewer is transported to. 
housing a range of extinct or threatened into extinction animals. And the camera is moving around the island in 10 minutes. And the composite is ever changing. So the composition is it's like a moving painting. It, there's no movement, uh, well, barely any movement. It's just the water is moving a bit artificially. And the audience seems to miss the loop mark every time, not realizing they too, too are trapped in this place. I've noticed when asking uh, audiences to see the, the work that they just keep on seeing new stuff. And some because of the movements, every time they miss the place where they are back on the same, uh, where the loop begins actually. So within the framework of my current PhD research, I'm, start, I'm still trying to position or reposition myself as an artist and a researcher. My research started out as an investigation into simulated landscapes and wilderness, but has turned into a psychological self-help trajectory. How do I deal with this ecological grief? How do we deal with the loss of habitat, environment, and species? And how can art help to deal with this loss? Let me help you by first help me. <laughs> so I would like to, let's see if it goes to the next. I would like to show a fragment of a work that talks about this. I'm using animation as a communication tool for this loss. So I'll end this talk with a fragment from Mistakes, the artist talk, which I made last year in the middle of the first lockdown which outlines the research in various chapters that move between reality and fiction. The whole 20 minute film can be found on my website. This chapter talks about the five stages of grief. And if we have a bit more time to spare, it will move into complicit, the next chapter, which is trying to get the viewer to accept responsibility by guilt trip. According to a psychologist, this is not recommended method for change, guilting people into uh, <laughs> changing their behavior. But I do believe that within artistic research, a certain amount of quackery is involved. After all, humor is a coping mechanism for grief too. Uh, and now I just realized that I forgot to share the audio somehow. So I'm not sure what's going to happen with the audio, but I'm just going to move forward with it anyway. Pablo Ross' model, Stages of Grief, postulates a series of emotions experienced by terminally ill patients prior to death, or people who have lost a loved one, wherein the five stages are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Although commonly referenced in popular media, the existence of these stages has not been demonstrated and the model is not considered helpful in explaining the grieving process. share because I'm afraid that the sound that the audio uh, might not come through anyway so um, but you can watch the whole film uh, on my website it's also on YouTube with a uh, great audio so thank you uh, thank you very much Alexandra um, for yeah completing this series of super nice talks um, yeah, what's really interesting or fascinating in your research is how you seem to combine like a transcendental kind of experience with uh, rooted in activism in the in the real life and how you how you seem to be able to reconcile both in like this very very artistic implementation of animation, which is really cool. Um, so yeah, thanks a lot and. 
thanks again, Guido and Gert, for making this such a beautiful session. Um, I think we still have 15 minutes of time for some Q&A. Maybe we should check first if there are some questions from the audience. Uh, I haven't seen any on the chat. Oh, yeah, I saw one question, but it was responded. It was just people who wanted to hear the sound of Hido's uh, last film that he showed, and the, the, the sound was already posted there. Yeah, I'm uh, sorry. I also forgot to uh, uh, share the sound. <laughs> But you can you can find them all on on YouTube on Vimeo or um, I share most of my work on Instagram actually. Uh. Okay, so now I read on the chat a very definite answer. We have no questions, um, which means that uh, I I'll, I yeah I have a lot of questions when I listen to you because it triggers me in, in all kind of respects. So I'll just I'll just start asking some questions that popped up in my head. And then just an invitation, uh, should some questions pop up with people in the audience, please interrupt us through the chat or just switch on your video and say like, hey, I wanna say something, all that is cool. Um, so please feel free to do that. Um, okay, so yeah, one thing I think the three of you have in common is that you are kind of like remediating like old techniques in, in a digital um, era. Um, and very often these, these different approaches, the old is then seen as more physical, analog, and very often authentic. And then the new is seen as digital, uh, artificial, and therefore less authentic. And it's, it's very often seen as like diametrically opposed to one another. And all three of you seem to be in this kind of move where you reconcile them and where you don't see that opposition. And Alexandra, you even said it uh, literal, literally, like there's art in artificial. And so I was wondering in the case of all the three of you actually, like how do you see that tension between the physical and the digital? And how does it work for you to reconcile both? And is it easy or do you encounter dif difficulties with it? Who's gonna go uh, first? Um, I, 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 I have to say that I had to defend my medium a lot within the conventional art world, particularly because of that idea that the computer does all the work, where's the art or um, it's also cold and, uh, and, and technological. But um, I have taught myself most of the, of, of everything actually that goes on behind the screen. And uh, during all those hours, days, nights, years, months, parts of my life, you develop an almost emotional connection to the machines. Um, and I think, um, I think it's absolutely untrue. I mean, it's a medium like, like painting. It's absolutely untrue that you cannot convey any kind of emotion or that there's no emotion involved in working with digital media. Of course there is. I mean, in any case, it's also some sort of manipulation and trickery. And in that sense, it doesn't really matter if you do it in oil paint or stone or in uh, zeros and ones. But I, I, I myself, I, I love all my, my machines, <laughs> all, all my old phones, all my old computers, all my old printers. <laughs> they have special places in my heart. I think what's quite daunting is that um, a, a computer will only do what it's told to be done. Uh, I think that's also why why um, a movement like glitch art is so popular because there you let a computer um, design its own language um, and generate mistakes because um, uh, as as humans we are we are uh, very inefficient. Uh, recently, I've, I've read somewhere um, that in a working day there's only uh, two hours of uh, efficiency uh, for us humans. Um, but um, 
in in a sense, uh, working working with a computer doesn't mean that you don't um, uh, generate uh, uh, emotionless art. Um, but the hybridization, uh, I think, is very interesting because um, you uh, allow uh, the the dirty real world to enter uh, onto the computer and vice versa. That's why I use three D prints. Uh, I've also experimented with three uh, D simulations, of course, but they are too perfect. So they they look too smooth, too perfect. And when you 3D print them, even in the highest quality printers, there's some kind of noise, something goes wrong, someone slams the door and there's like this little bump in your 3D print. Um, and that's what, what makes it, um, um, what makes it so, so, um, so real. Uh, that it's not perfect. It's a bit like the, the wabi-sabi uh, philosophy in Japanese aesthetics, so uh, where uh, true beauty can only, um, uh, in a nutshell, true beauty can only exist through um, imperfection. Yeah, the the incorporation of real life textures is, is something that uh, can can take care of all these uh, perfect uh, images that. Uh, computers might generate, of course, but when you look at uh, VFX artists, what they do is basically uh, when you see, uh, for instance, scenes that they create with all these mega scans, so these are scans from real world objects, they try to uh, replicate almost uh, to, the, to the pixel these textures. Eh? So one does not exclude the other. I mean, it's clear that, that they want that... Uh, that realness comes from uh, the griminess of the real world. And that's what I love about uh, these, these, these kinds of uh, images, but uh, I am not, I do not recoil of using a digital medium. Uh, for, uh, if I can quote, if I can quote uh, Eddie Izzard, he, uh, in a sketch, he tells about uh, the use of technology that people are, are fearful of using technology. He says, I, I don't have techno fear, I have techno joy. And that is, I can identify with uh, that statement. Uh, I, I can, uh, I like using these new technologies and even I love using them completely wrong and to see what happens when I use them completely wrong. Uh, I like to jump in without even a manual. Maybe that's very male of me to say, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, these are the, the, the experiments that make interesting uh, uh, that can have interesting result results not all the time but uh, i think uh, that that drives uh, me to uh, to try all these uh, hybrid tests yeah absolutely I totally, totally agree uh, it's also the reason why i really like working with photogrammetric models uh, I'm, I'm my models are really bad i mean there's all holes and some parts are just they look like they are in decay even though they're super high tech in a way and I, I just love the, the imperfection of it. Also, like, for instance, mistakes, the artist talk that Filma was talking about earlier is not, I mean, it's called mistakes because it, it contains so many mistakes on all kinds of level, technical mistakes, uh, uh, mistakes in uh, philosophy, all kinds of mistakes. It's like embrace your failures. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, we can go on about this for a long time. I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Conversation, but we had a question from the YouTube channel, which I thought was super interesting. Um, and Jody asks the question: There was an interesting theme in the three works: the use of loops and repetition. I wonder if these have different meanings for the different artists. Um, so. Yes, very, very clever question, I think. And I'm curious to hear the answer. Yeah, well, um, let me maybe start because the loop animation is like in, in the title of my PhD uh, dissertation. And uh, this also relates to my background as a graphic um, uh, artist or, or as a comic book artist, um, where I 
always make linear stories, but um, when I do audiovisual work, um, loops came like natural to me. It was the natural way of expressing myself was through loops, not through um, linear stories. Um, I've been thinking about that a lot, of course. Um, uh, one thing uh, which is quite important about this is uh, the way you look at the work of, of art. So, um, and this relates a bit to the work of, of uh, uh, the philosopher Walter Benjamin. Um, so if you look uh, to a painting, you're in a mode of com contemplation. Whereas if you um, uh, watch something which is from the entertainment industry, you, you watch uh, with a mode of distraction. And I think the loop is in um, the audiovisual arts um, is a way of um, finding an in between between uh, the, the 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 perceptive mode of distraction and the perceptive mode of contemplation. Um, it also relates, of course, to to other aspects. For instance, um, um, when you look to uh, loops in music, uh, in electronic music, they relate to um, a, a sort of transcendental way of um, perceiving sound, um, an ecstatic way of perceiving sound. And um, uh, for me, it's important to uh, try to implement the same um, emotion also in my visual work. If that might be an answer. Yeah, when you look at loops as a classical 2D animator, that is where you start. Eh? For, uh, mm -hmm. When you start animating, they're going to teach you a bouncing ball that loops and you're going to uh, have a maybe a love-hate relationship with uh, animating walk cycles, maybe in the beginning. Uh, but when you get better at it, it's still loops that uh, uh, make you get better at animating. And for me, uh, like Guido also, uh, I have a more uh, a special relationship with loop because I have uh, the past 20 years been also an electronic artist. So uh, the that got me introduced into the VJing world and uh, the relation between these uh, ele electronic uh, loops almost in which the, most of the tracks have been built up. Uh, the, it's, it's, uh, there's almost an unlinkable, uh, un, un, uh, unseparate, uh, there's no separation between the, 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 the different kind of video loops that are being linked to uh, these performances, for instance, they try to sync it to the BPM of the song. It's also repetition. It doesn't have to be uh, a, a linear kind of narrative. When you're when you're dealing with music, especially electronic music, there's you could do it, but most of the time, it's it's more of a abstract kind of of narration. Uh, you still use loops. You lower you layer these loops on top of each other. And you create new visuals out of the same loops. Say when you take two loops away, add another one. It's it's the same what happens with music. And so you have these loops looping. You, you take a few, uh, you take out the hat, the snare, and the hi hat. Same with visuals. You have like pictures of a forest that loop, the moon somewhere, and you blend all this stuff together, and you you end up with new new material. And that is uh, a bit my uh, relation to uh, loops. Okay. I, if, if, if I have... Uh, you can, you can have see, the last word, Alexander. <laughs> I see it even more philosophical than that. I mean, life in a way is a loop. Every time you go to bed and you wake up, you're, that's the, the weld of the loop <laughs> each morning. <laughs> so there's something really gratifying but also very constraining about the loop <laughs> okay i can have just 20 more seconds like people <laughs> people uh in in before industrialization 
they lived loops. They lived according to changing seasons, uh, to uh, on 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 rhythms of the moon, et cetera, et cetera. We've lost that uh, in our society, uh, and I think it's uh, maybe something we reintroduce then as uh, visual artists. Wow. <laughs> Okay, I think that's um, our time is totally um, totally finished. Yes, I was just going to interrupt you, Guido. Although it was very interesting, we need to go on with our afternoon program. So I hope you enjoyed these wonderful presentations and Q&A as much as I did. Um, there will be a small break between this session and the next session about sound and media. Just will give you the chance to grab a coffee, maybe stretch your legs and uh, prepare yourself for the next presentation. The break will run from four until 10 past four. So I will see you all in 10 minutes. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <clears throat> Bye.
Hello, Mark. Hi. Hello, Jürgen. Hey, hey. Am I audible at all? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great, great. Thank you so much for being here, guys. Likewise. I'm in the office, so we'll hear the occasional airplane going over, just as an added sound effect. <laughs> okay. We're ready to rock and roll? I think so, yeah. <laughs> I have to admit, I'm a bit nervous, but... No oh, it just does. I know, I know, but still, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's presenting stuff. Yeah, yeah it'll be all right. It'll be over soon. It'll no, it's just, it's just also been a bit, a bit really hectic. Agreed. We're on air. Okay. okay. Hello, all. <clears throat> Mark, I think everyone might be waiting for you to moderate this. <laughs> Hi, Mark. Hi. I thought I would be introduced by uh, by Hannah. Uh, thank you so much, Barry, for reminding me. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this last uh, but not least session uh, for today. I'm very, too, uh, very happy to be here and uh, to be able to present and moderate my two distinguished guests. Um, my two colleagues, uh, I must say, one colleague from very nearby, Jürgen, is attending and is presenting his uh, uh, mocap uh, audio project. And uh, a colleague, a new colleague, I must say, within Film EU, David Novak, is talking to us from uh, uh, Lisboa. Very happy to uh, meet both of you. Uh, first of all, I want to introduce um, both of you a bit uh, ex more extensive. Um, well, first of all, Jürgen de Blonde is a sound guru, I can say, from my own institution, even my own hometown, Ghent, in Belgium. He loves making music. Uh, he's all into uh, noise as well, in his own words, not mine. And uh, he's uh, also responsible for the audio workspace at Lucas School of Arts. And luckily, he's teaching as well, so to get him away from, from making just noise, but doing something uh, productive. And uh, we're all very happy that he's doing that for all of us and our students. He remains an active, uh, of course, sound artist and creates work for stage and installations, a number of uh, albums, LPs, and, and mind you, uh, cassettes. So for the people too young to know, cassettes is really the new kind of medium. Look it up. Um, he holds a master in visual arts and mixed media. And he, of course, has a, a fascination and a sensitivity to sound in all its facets. And uh, what intrigues him daily and connects him to the world is really sound and makes him happy, I suppose. His motto, therefore, is seeing if seeing is believing, hearing is reality or much close to reality. I think this is about what the what what um, Jürgen has to say about sound. And I think David Novak uh, on the other side is going to be agreeing or maybe not. Let's hear in a while. Uh, David started with a degree in engineering and music. He has enjoyed uh, award winning career in mixing for dozens of films uh, and of course sound design as well so he's uh, he's he's uh, uh, very agile in in both of those uh, teams he's been working for live theater installations and so on he uh, did the international tour of by roger waters and he did uh, some work sound projection for toronto meridian arts um, in uh center of death of a salesman in yiddish in addition, he is a filmmaker. Um, he won several awards in documentary. I had the pleasure of watching Finding uh, Abel, uh, uh, Babel uh, just uh, a while ago, and I was intrigued by his work. He is done visually as well, so maybe that's one of the questions I want to pose to him. What's the difference between uh, using the image element and versus the sonic element? Um, 
but um, he's now teaching at uh, Lusophona. He's a researcher in sound studies, and he will present his latest research uh, project during this session. So welcome, both of you. Maybe before we go on, I would like to ask, did I miss anything? Did I um, uh, maybe need to correct me on some stuff? So please, uh, a few lines maybe from, from Jürgen, if you find all is correct, please say so. If not, please elaborate on yourself. Okay, I'm, I'm fine. Thanks for introducing uh, me and David uh, so elaborately, Mark. So um, nothing to add, really. Okay, thank you. David, anything to add? You left out the part that I have a really strong penchant for chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> so that means you're going to be visiting, visiting us in a while. Yes, for sure. And I've been working on, you know, trying to figure out exactly what the sound of chocolate is. And the good thing about it is that the more I eat chocolate, the more ideas I get. So I hope I never come to a conclusion of what chocolate sounds like. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, let's make a note of that. Um, so pra pra practicalities, Jürgen will start with his presentation, followed by David, and uh, only after those two presentations, we're going to have a Q&A and some discussions, I hope, because we've got two sound people um, in our midst. So, um, But first of all, I'd like to give the floor to Jürgen. He's uh, at the moment researching the domain of immersive character of sound, and more specifically, uh, its spatialization, its location within this 3D environment. Um, it is crucial that all sonic elements, as we all know, dialogue, foley, and other diegetic elements, so part of the story world, is correctly integrated in the 360 image uh, environment. And uh, in, in audio mocap, his project, Jürgen, is looking for ways of locating and automating, if, if we can, tracking the audio sources within the 3D space and thus facilitating the audio post production, which could be uh, very handy because uh, last year I had the, the privilege of, of, of doing a 360 film. And of course, in post, you have a lot of work locating all the special sources and uh, that this takes up uh, a, a strong uh, effort. So um, I'm, I'm very happy that Jürgen is looking into that. But of course, he will know and he can explain it far better than I can. So the floor is yours, Jürgen. Um, <laughs> that was already half of my presentation. <laughs> but, <laughs> anyway, here we go. So, um, yes, as, as Mark already said, my name is Jürgen de Blonde, uh, and I work at Luca Arts in Ghent, where I teach sound and editing, and I run the workshop, the audio workshop. And I'd like to present, basically, uh, the outlines of the project I'm involved in, uh, named Audio Mocap. Um, the project does indeed sprout from an idea uh, from Mark's uh, research, Mark van der Wallen's research last year in a 360 uh, film. And it's uh, picked up by Kasper Jordaans, who's a colleague of mine um, and myself. And, um, well, Mark's previous research involved the production of a 360 film and all the difficulties that did indeed arise in the production and post-production also in terms of sound. And that seemed like an interesting point of departure for the research. So the core question is basically how to capture sound in motion or vice versa, how to capture motion, motion in sound. Um, first of all, of course, we need to uh, define the problem. And what is the problem? The problem is that when uh, capturing 360 video, it is logical to also capture 360 audio. Video can be done with a 360 camera and audio can be captured with any first order or higher order ambisonics microphone. And both video and audio when lined up in the right orientation will produce an end result with basic spatial truthfulness. However, the problem arises when production audio is partially or completely unusable due to unwanted noise on the set and parts have to be reconstructed in post-production as often happens in uh, filmmaking. But more problems occur even when the actors wear um, clip-on mics or lavaliers, or there are sound producing objects also moving around in the 360 space. And the big, the big difference there is of course that you work in a 360 space, so everything is basically visible on set and, vis uh, and basically also audible. So there are complexities that arise in a 360 context that are not necessarily there when working in, in, in traditional 2D cinema. Um, <clears throat> right. Um, 
So what is ambisonics? I want to illustrate that shortly, uh, very short, by just showing a couple of first order and higher order ambisonic microphones. So basically ambisonics um, or 360 sound can be captured by a microphone that is uh, built out of four microphone capsules. Here we see one, two, three, four. They're in a, a tetrahedric formation, both here, or a higher order ambisonics microphone. Here we see a second order uh, ambisonics microphone. Here we see a third order microphone. This one contains eight capsules. This one contains 16, I believe. Um, the higher the order of the ambisonics, the higher the resolution uh, of the, the, the spatial exactness um, to put it like, uh, if I may put it like that. Um, <clears throat> and this kind of microphone is usually set up uh, in a central position, just like the 360 camera. So it captures the, the full spatiality of the audio of the onset audio. Um, and it is it can be captured in, in either a raw format, which is called uh, a format, and then can be decoded into a, a, a different uh, spatial uh, format. It can also be uh, converted back to stereo or to another binaural version. Um, the big advantage of, of this technique is that it's uh, not sp as a speaker uh, dependent as uh, traditional uh, methods of uh, surround sound. Um, okay, um, so this is the logo of Ambisonics, um, in which is reflected um, the full spatial field that is captured. In it we see um, small circles and a big circle. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just showing this because I want to briefly uh, explain the concept uh, of Ambisonics and how it works. So we see that it um, captures sound according to a uh, front-back axis, an x-axis, and a left-right axis, the y-axis, an up-down axis, the z-axis, and then the big black circle surrounding it is, um, is referred to as the, 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 the pressure or the omnidirectionality. So there's three axes for directionality, and then there's a fourth a coordinate used for um, measuring the pressure and the correlation between those four um, parameters can be used for decoding or constructing a 360 surround um, sound field. Ironically, this technology has been around since the late 60s, early 70s, was developed by Michael Gerson, but because it wasn't really um, practical and there was lack of, of, of consumer-friendly hardware, it sort of... Um, never took off until maybe the last 10 to 15 years, where it turned out to be very useful in the context of, of 360 audio, 360 video, VR, and other um, immersive uh, sound applications. Um, in order to reproduce these sound fields, we do need at least four speakers or more. Um, and that's, um, like I said before, that's also the strength of ambisonics, that it can be reproduced speaker independently. So you can also reproduce an ambisonics um, surround field by five or by six or by 20 speakers. Whereas, for example, a traditional 5.1 uh, surround mix is stuck to five speakers and a, a subwoofer. Um, okay, on to the next slide. Um, I'm going to show a couple of slides now that help me explain and define the problem. So what you see here is a very um, simplistic uh, scheme of a, a top-down view from a, a hypothetical film set where uh, I've used the Ambisonics logo to, 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 to pinpoint the surround microphone and that's also the place where the 360 camera is. And on the film set, we have uh, Mr. Blue, Mr. Red, and Mr. Green. They both are uh, in a certain position in relation to the surround microphone, uh, and they're in a static position. If you reproduce the recording 
like that, we will hear, and we re if we reproduce the recording um, in a spatial context, we will hear the positions of these three actors very clearly. Also, quite logically, if they start moving around in space, we will also hear their moving uh, and their movement in relation to the microphone. Also, when they uh, come closer or when they go further away from the microphone, we will also hear the proximity of the actors. So that's all very, um, very um, logical. And then the problem that really arises is when these actors also have wear their own microphones, right? Because then we get two streams of audio. The first stream of audio is, is spatially defined. We hear the actors in relation to the microphone. And the second stream of audio, because the actors wear uh, subject locked, as I call them, subject locked microphones, these microphones do not carry spatial relation. So if we open these, uh, which will become clear in uh, the next couple of slides, if we open the audio streams of these microphones, they will not contain any spatial information. But we might want to use those microphones in a spatial context when we um, work with this material in a post-production uh, context, for example, or even in a real-time uh, context. Um, so, um, this is only a situation with three uh, actors. This is a picture I found of a hypothetical um, situation where you have multiple uh, sound sources moving around in a 3D space that all have relation to uh, the central position. Um, and here's an example of what things look like in a DAW, in a digital audio workstation. This is a situation in which I recorded my own voice um, with both a subject lock microphone, so uh, a microphone I was wearing, like the one I'm wearing right now on my chest. And in the center of the room, I had a 360 microphone um, set up. And as you can see, the stream of um, coming out of a 360 micro uh, microphone consists of four channels, each microphone capsule uh, showing up here. And my, uh, my own microphone is clearly only one uh, stream of audio, also a monophonic uh, stream of audio because it's only one microphone. Um, in the next slide, you can clearly see what, what, what happens or what the difference is between these two um, microphones, once again, illustrating it. So the, the subject lock microphone here in this particular slide, you can see me moving into a different room. So my sound is completely going away um, on the spatial microphone. I'm moving away from the microphone. I'm also moving into a next room. So I'm disappearing from this microphone. But on the microphone I am wearing, I'm still very audible. So this is an extreme situation, but it does illustrate um, where the difficulty arises. And as you can also see here and in the next slide, um, if we zoom in even more, you can see how the, 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 the spatial information is reproduced. You can see the differences on the four channels of the four microphone capsules. And at the same time, here is the sound of my locked microphone. So I can use software or plugins to locate this microphone in a spatial relation. If I, if I wanted to remix this, uh, if I needed to, to, to remix this in, in post-production. But the problem is that this is a very tedious and arduous um, process. Because as you can see here, and normally this should be uh, animated. As you can see here, this line, for example, is just, I think, about one minute of sound that I tried to manually, very quickly, very dirtily, tried to spatialize. So here you can see the spatial movement. And um, so imagine you would have to do this for not one, but four actors, for example. And you would have to do this for a, 
a full feature film. It's just insane the amount of time that will go into that. Uh, and so that's why I thought, wouldn't it be very practical if um, if it if it if it were possible to capture um, the motion of the actors uh, actors um, in a three D space, and so that we could use these data, so not the audio necessarily, but that we could use the data to um, spatialize. And, and, and automate the spatialization process of um, of non-spatialized audio, right? The um, application possibilities of that would also be very interesting. So, for uh, audio motion capture, the idea is to capture the motion of non-spatialized sound sources. So. Uh, sound sources that are stuck to the subject to which the microphone is stuck, to use the data of motion to capture um, that, to spatialize audio in the post-production workflow. Um, but we could also use those same data and attach new sounds to them. That's also very interesting, right? Because that's also something that often happens in a post-production process, that sounds have to be replaced because they have to be bigger or more dramatic um and if they have um a spatial function it's also very practical if we could um automate that process and just attach new sounds to those data that have been captured um eventually we could also maybe use the data of motion capture for real-time spatialization in the context of gaming uh, vr virtual conferencing um, and it, 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 it goes it goes further than the current spatialization technologies that are available for virtual conferencing um, because you could spatialize uh, speakers that also wear um, spot on uh, spot clip on microphones um, and one idea we would like to further um, derive from that project is that um, we would also like to research if it's at all possible to capture the acoustics or the, the, the full spatial information of two real spaces and potentially blend them into a third virtual um, meeting space. But that's um, the wildest of our um, dreams. So the questions that arise in this research is what hardware and software technologies can we use to capture motion of uh, beings and objects that are moving sound sources, that is? How to translate those data into usable data for spatialization in post-production workflow? Can we apply that same process in real time? Uh, and can we actually blend two acoustic spaces into a third virtual acoustic space? Um, and the approach of this, uh, how we would like to approach or how we are approaching it and how we will uh, in the future approach it is by using a combination of subject lock microphones and a first order or higher order ambisonics microphone, but also motion trackers, which could be the motion trackers from Xbox, for example, or, or other uh, hardware motion trackers. We would also like to look into the possibilities of working with depth cameras um, and maybe also even look at what is possible um, to derive from the actual audio information or video information uh, and see what data we can derive from that. And we need to be able to write those motion data to the automation curves, the envelope lines that plot the changes in the parameters that are used for spatialization. So for post-production, the interesting aspects there are the motion of sound sources can be captured, they can be replaced, uh, the original sounds can be replaced by um, just keeping the spatial relation intact but just putting new sounds on it. Uh, we could layer extra sounds that are spatialized which is also you know just techniques that are often used in sound effects, sound design and, and, and foley but um, we could easily duplicate those automation lines and, and, and add numerous sounds to those. And we could also create entirely new sound scenes, uh, effects and foley based on the spatial data. We could we could create entirely new scenes with with um, yeah, just based on those data and replace everything in there. 
and then uh, for real-time uh, purposes uh, we could look into real-time rendering of subject locked audio into spatial audio spatialization of speakers with clip-on microphones we could also uh, dive into a greater definition of a spatial context for ease of listening and i think during the uh, both lockdowns uh, we've all uh, come to learn how uncomfortable it can be to be in a virtual uh, meeting room for hours and hours without having actual or proper spatial um, audio uh, i think it, it would it would become very uh, a lot more comfortable if we had more accurate spatial information uh, about the yeah about the people we're meeting which is also why the blending of spaces could be interesting so um, thank you for your attention and um, yeah, keep it in motion. Thank you so much, Jürgen, and I'm very excited as well as I'm part of this uh, project as well. And yeah, I had a, it was a big effort imposed to uh, make all this happen. And, and I hope this is like a new opportunity to make it, to facilitate at least that, that process. That would be so great. So Jürgen has explained to us how correctly, uh, how to correctly locate real life sound source while shooting and translate that data into editing process. David, on the other hand, touches on triggering non-existing sounds through the theory of embodied cognition, uh, something I don't really understand yet, but I'm sure he's going to explain to us within the next 10-15 uh, minutes. Uh, David, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, so, what I want to present here is this study that I've been doing called Measuring the Impact of Cinema Sound Effects on Audiences and Certain Key Paradigms. And where I came across this question was through the idea that um, sound design is frequently assumed uh, in all kinds of academic papers that one reads that there are cognitive and emotive processes um, involved in the addition of sound effects. Um, but I've found very, very little that seeks to demonstrate whether or not this is empirically true. Uh, and so I decided to design um, a study that looks to four primary outcomes. There are certainly more, but I'm kind of making buckets of, of desired effects of sound effects, um, one of which is attention and focus, another is memory and impression, uh, imparting narrative and meaning. And I, I know well that narrative and meaning are two different things, um, but they're very interrelated. And you'll see as I get to the study why I put them in a single bucket. Um, and also enhancing emotion, um, enhancing the experience. And there's many ways that we can talk about phenomenology or uh, what it is that an audience is, is going through over the course of, of watching a film. Uh, and in order to do so, I created this study that has both quantitative uh, elements and qualitative elements uh, using various softwares, SPSS and NVivo in order to do my statistical analysis in both. The fundamental hypothesis of the study is that sound design does have measurable impacts uh, in these areas. Um, and so the object of study is a film called Koyana Skatsi from 1982 uh, by Godfrey Reggio, a wonderful film. I highly recommend it. Um, it's a, it. It can be a difficult film. Um, and I chose it for a number of reasons. First of all, it is filled with poetic images, um, not all that concrete in terms of the message that is being relayed. There is no dialogue in the film. It is multi-sensorial to begin with because it has very powerful music. That music is by Philip Glass. Um, and I'm actually asking myself now if as, is, as an example for the study, having such powerful music might have undermined certain things that I'm trying to show. Um, and yet it also helps in many, many ways. So. Um, that remains to be seen. And there's virtually no sound effects. There's one or two areas in the film where there's a little bit of wind um, and, and that's it. Uh, so this was my object of study because we have a poetic piece with dialogue, with music. So it's already multi-sensorial and I'm adding sound design to that. Again, we're looking for these four yellow paradigms, but narrative and meaning I'm breaking out into a few other areas. One is physical diegesis, what we typically think of as film diegesis, right? The, the environment, the story world uh, where we are. Another I am terming thematic diegesis. Uh, 
which is to say how are certain images that are unfolding before our eyes tied together thematically, right? Within a sense of meaning, right? What are the themes that are being evoked that people are thinking about uh, when things are put together? So I'm calling that thematic diegesis. And then in another area called imagined sound, which is absolutely fundamental uh, to our filmic experience since the silent film years. Uh, and I'll get into a little more detail on that later. So the independent variable here is sound design itself. So I have a group who looks at the film in its original form without the sound effect sound design. And I have another group that looks at it with the sound design um, and they complete uh, the same survey. The survey is 50 questions. Um, it's in English, uh, although we did a Portuguese version as well. I wrote down here, we don't have time to view it today. I do have a link available. And if you have a little time, I can play a couple of minutes of it. If not, at the end of this, I'll be happy to drop a link into the chat and anybody can look at the sound design version of the last 15 minutes of Koyan Scotsi. Um, this is what the survey looks like. As an example, here's just a few questions. Um, you, for instance, that question in the middle says, how strongly do you feel there is a connection between these shots, right? Uh, that's gonna be something quantitative I can measure. And then please describe what that understanding is of the sequence, what is it trying to communicate? Uh, so that becomes qualitative uh, textual analysis. We had uh, combined in all of our groups, we had 165 people uh, who did the A version and 159 people who did the B version, which is pretty good. And that's a nice size group for a study like this. Um, there are some other complications involved. If we get time later, we can talk about it in detail because some very interesting things came from the COVID uh, stress of having to do this because we planned on doing this in a theater with a randomized audience, as random as we could get in a mall, uh, but then COVID hit. And so we ended up with a theatrical version that we did here at school with graduate students and a version online. Uh, via something called Mechanical Turk, which is Amazon's platform for all kinds of outsourcing work. Um, and we got different results from the two groups, but combining the results actually gave us the most strong demographics. Uh, and so I'm mostly relying on the combined results when we're doing our analysis. Um, the aggregate, I'll skip ahead because I don't want to I want to get to the meat of it pretty quickly. We don't have all that much time. In the quantitative results, uh, we're looking for statistical significance. And here's sort of the chart. And if, if we have any statistics geeks out there like myself, um, you'll see that the significance level P needs to be below 0 0.05 to be within what's called the 95% confidence interval. And when in fact, a paradigm does show up with that, we are measuring a, a significant difference um, based on a number of, of, of um, statistics metrics. Um, so let's look at these individually. One of the first ones that came up is uh, memory. These two images are both from a sequence of people, a long sequence of people, to which I added a metaphor, a phone ringing, a phone ringing that does not get picked up. There is an intention of that metaphor, which we'll talk about later, um, but we found that both of these images uh, had a statistically significant decrease in how much they were being remembered. I thought that was fascinating. It was a very unexpected result. Um, and there are hypotheses that these generate that need to be further tested. In this case, that the, this different kind of multisensorial, textured, um, contrapuntal, right? Uh, meaning having the metaphor there actually may have taken people to a place intellectually, subconsciously, consciously, who knows, um, that might have taken them away from the, from the registration of the image. We'll look into that a little bit more later. This image, which was not in a sequence of people, but was a very uh, relative, a static shot of this guy moving around a little bit, had the opposite impact. Um, it, was, it was more remembered. And all that was added in sound effects here was some low frequency rumble and some alarm sounds, some distant alarm sounds, sort of changing the nature of this guy just sitting here, mostly doing nothing and smoking a cigarette. Um, I did that intentionally 
trying out one of uh, Michel Chion's theories called contrast, which is one of his five rhetorical figures of the relationship between what we hear and what we see. Uh, and by having this guy very still, very calm sitting in a workplace, but presenting some sounds that might give a sense of anxiety, right? I'm giving a contrast between what we see and what we hear. And with this contrast in this one long shot, um, this image was, was remembered more, significantly more. Um, in Imagine Sound, Imagine Sound is fascinating. Uh, in short, when we expect to hear a sound that would be produced by a visual stimulus, if we see that stimulus, the secondary auditory cortex where we process sort of the interaction between what we hear and cognitive function gets activated and it seems like it gets activated in the same way as if we had actually heard the sound. Uh, as much as it can be measured for now, it, it looks like it's exactly the same way. So this is imagined sound. This is used extensively in, 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 in Eisenstein montage and the rhythms that are created with things that we see that make sound. Um, so all the way back in the, silent, in the silent days. In this case, this woman is lighting a lighter. In the version without sound effects, a few people, very few, think they heard the lighter. In the version with sound effects, significantly more think they heard the lighter, even though there is more, right? The sound effect that's added here is a heartbeat. It has nothing to do with the lighter and it's clearly a heartbeat. In uh, this piece, uh, the four images that you see along with a number of others are connected in, through a sequence. They have little to do with each other in terms of their physical locations. Um, one is a fire scene, another is uh, um, somebody who is Ill, either ill or on drugs or half conscious is being loaded onto a stretcher. We have this woman in a car. You can see from the reflection of the car that there's a, you know, a, a modern Manhattan high rise next to her, an office tower, and, and a guy sitting, sitting in a window half naked. Um, I join these with emergency sounds, general city ambience, um, and gave sound to the car, this car, the engine and the window. And in doing this, I created a sonic sequence that really merges, merges these together in physical space. This is all very standard editing and sound editing. Doing this, there's nothing unusual about pretty much anything that I did in here in the sound design um, intentionally. And so uh, there was, in fact, a significant increase in the, the degree to which people thought these images were connected in space. So it served its function, right, to create a diegesis that doesn't actually exist. Um, interestingly, it was significantly different in, in the combined sample, but it was much more significant in, in Mechanical Turk and the people who did the study online. Um, I thought that was interesting. There's more to drill into that later, uh, but I don't think I'll be able to get into that today. Here, I'm looking at thematic diegesis, as I had recalled. So we're back to that sequence with all of the people. Um, you've seen the two lower images already. Uh, the telephone ringing is the metaphor that's been added. A very strongly significant difference has been registered uh, in terms of are these people connected, not physically, but in what the film is trying to say about their presence being intercut together, right? Um, a very strong sense of connectedness to this people. And this speaks to a formation of narrative or meaning across the images brought together by this metaphorical sound effect. So the metaphor worked in terms of connecting some thought, some process. Um, what's interesting, as we'll see later, is that it didn't help them consolidate on what I was trying to make them think. And that's a really fascinating result um, of this part of the study. We also took the, uh, there were a number of questions on thematic diegesis. And so oh, that was, there was only one, that one that on its own showed significant difference but I thought it might be instructed to lump them together into a bucket, right? Which is a standard statistical thing to do and see if overall, in fact, there is an increase in a sense of thematic diegesis across the four or five questions that address that. And there was, um, and there was with physical diegesis as well when I lumped a number of, of scenes that we put together 
um, in physical diegesis. And what's really interesting here is that for some of these, they're put together through profilmic sound effects, meaning sound effects that feel diegetic to the scene. They feel like they're part of the, the story itself, part of the narrative itself, as well as sound effects that are clearly cinematic discourse. And this may mean, you know, the addition of the metaphor, right? That telephone has nothing to do with the, the location where we were, but even mixing techniques, like when we do a crossfade, right? Between two, two sounds as we're going from one scene into another, perhaps we let the outgoing sound go for three or four seconds and gradually fade away. These are all part of cinematic discourse. This is part of the, the, the storytelling, right? The narration, if, if you were. And in both cases, right? In both cases, we see this increase in both physical and thematic diegesis um, on the part of the audience. Okay, um, I'm going to scooch ahead a little bit and look at what we're looking at in the qualitative, right? So in the qualitative study, we now have a lot of text. People have answered questions. What were you thinking during this sequence? What were you thinking during this shot? What did you think about the overall film? What do you think the message was? Um, and we're looking at their interpretation of their experience. And then we have to interpret their questions. And so I'm bringing up this notion of um, hermeneutics, which is going to be really important uh, as I go through a little bit more analysis um, in, in, in how it is that we're able to, to uh, interpret, right? In interpretation, there's a lot of room for error in here in terms of, you know, what do people really remember? Um, what was their mood that day? Right? What was their mood in that moment? What were they distracted by while they were filling out the survey? Right? As well as us, we have to go through um, a, a method of statistical interpretation of their written word. Right? And there are dozens of different theories around how to go about doing that, uh, how about to, to doing that in, in a way that makes sense. Most of those theories are actually developed around psychological research. Um, where you have case studies with people sitting in an office, um, you know, telling, telling their stories uh, about whatever it might be. And so I feel a little relaxed that um, nobody's, nobody's mental health is relying on how we do this interpretation. Uh, but still, it, it's very important to follow some standard processes. And, and, and I have, I'm not going to go into them in detail at the moment. The other thing is that targeted meaning, right, is all we can really go for when we are putting in particularly metaphors, but even everything in art, in abstraction, we can aim at a meaning. Um, it seemed to me in, in the results that were generated that what was more important was getting people to feel something, to think something. Whether or not they actually hit the targeted meaning remains to be seen, right? It, it, some, some cases it seemed yes, in some cases it seemed no. Um, I have this quote from Deleuze saying the real was no longer represented, he's talking about Italian neorealism, or reproduced, but only aimed at, right? We can aim at these things. We can't guarantee that our audience is going to, to receive them. So emotional impression and narrative meaning are the things that we're looking for, narrative and meaning, uh, looking for most closely. And why I put narrative and meaning together is because when you say in a questionnaire, um, what were you thinking or what do you think the story was telling you at a particular point, people's language, their language does not separate narrative and meaning. Um, it's kind of impossible to do that. Uh, most audience viewers don't understand what the difference is between narrative and meaning. And so um, I kept them lumped together and instead put them in thematic categories thematic categories that can be either narrative or meaning. So like, here's some categories to look at. Uh, question six was what's your overall understanding? And I'm, I only have the slide up to really kind of demonstrate the themes that are in here. So the bottom one, two, three, four, five, six down there are the major themes, humanity, time, technology, money, environment, and destruction. Humanity, all the themes above it are subcodes to humanity. So these are all questions, all answers that we're dealing with people um, or dealing with society, right? 
um, things that really related to humanity went into that bucket, that giant humanity bucket. If they specifically dealt with, for instance, diversity, the connectivity or disconnection between people, routine, overpopulation, then they would go into those buckets. If they were much more general in terms of just social statements, they went into this general humanity bucket. Okay, um, on all of these charts, the blue are uh, the results without sound effects, right? The first A group, the orange is the group uh, with sound effects. And we see not a huge change, but we see a, a consolidation actually towards general humanity and the connectivity of people. Others go down for the most part, okay? There is a 10% increase in codable themes. So we're taking their language and we're coding it into these buckets, right? Based on what they're saying, right? And it turned out that we had many more codes, 10% more codes um, with sound effects. And that means people are thinking more, right? Okay. Um, this question is about the connectivity between these three images. And there's a whole bunch of images at the beginning of the sequence where we have urban aerials followed by computer chips, followed by Native American tapestries. The sound effects added to put these together are birds, air and wind, and a cyclical eagle screech, uh, which addresses some other sound theories that I won't go into, into now. And what we found with sound effects is that more people felt more strongly that the images are connected and they found richer discursive elements. You see a lot more orange popping up. Many more themes are popping up in the orange. And that's an indication to us that there's just more thinking going on as those sound effects have been added. And really interestingly to me, urbanism uh, went down. And that's kind of significant. When I look at this image of aerials of the city, the other ones sort of look like cities from above. And we see in people's comments that they were all cities, but we see a greater understanding that they are not all cities when we have the sound effects added, um, very interestingly. Okay, um, here we have uh, uh, an aerial shot that passes over a baseball stadium. And then it cuts to images of office buildings with some lights going on and off. So it's not a still image, but the camera doesn't move, the shot doesn't move. All we added was a cheering crowd to the stadium. And we carried that crowd over, right? Cinematic discourse over into the next shot and let it carry all the way through that shot. And you hear cheers and screams and, and, and yelps. There was a targeted meaning here. I was hoping to get audiences to think about perhaps how we, we often cheer work or celebrate work as much as we do leisure um, or to set up that kind of a contrast. I didn't get any of that, right? Um, but what I did find is that the quantitative study showed an increasing sort of insignificant increase, but an increase in thematic diegesis tying these together. It did show an increase. There's a 20% increase in quotable themes. That's a lot of higher order thinking. And audiences with the sound effect showed a 94% increase in references to people. We coded for people separately in this. So the addition of that, uh, that sound effect of a crowd through synchresis, right? Just taking a sound effect and putting it in sync with what it is that we see really registered the idea of people with audiences. David, I'm so sorry. I think we're kind of running out of time. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. To uh, interrupt you. And I saw um, Jürgen taking notes. So I think we, uh, we all need to get together again. But if I'm not mistaken, you're doing, well, not the same, but more elaborate tomorrow as well on the conferences itself. It's, it'll actually be shorter tomorrow. It'll be a little oh, bit shorter tomorrow. tomorrow. So yeah. it's going to be, no, it's very interesting. What I yeah. might take away from, from all this is like, um, this sound effects is is more and more important. While I was thinking, 
while at film school, uh, dialogue was the only narrative kind of uh, lead and guide. It becomes something completely different now. We see in yeah. movies like 1917, Dunkirk, where you feel like, I'm, am I listening to dialogue, music, or is it just sound effects? So I found this very interesting and that would be my question, but I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, we don't have time anymore, but this is something maybe for all people listening in and watching us maybe to take away, like, do we have still this distinction uh, between those three or is it like one blurry thing that we can all experiment with? But uh, no, thank you so much, both of you, Jürgen and uh, David for your uh, work and uh, looking forward to, to all the research is gonna be uh, outputted from, from what both of you are doing. So thank you. So so much. Um, I need to give the word to Dora and uh, before I go up because we came in kind of with a bang I didn't present myself I am Mark I teach at Luca Film of Arts as, and School of Arts and I, um, I am head of uh, Film EU for Luca as well and I uh, gladly give now the last word to Dora who is with uh, SFE. Thank you so much. Thank you Mark. Hello, my name is Dora Laszlo Gouyash. I'm the project support specialist at SFE, University of uh, Theatre and Film Arts in Hungary, and a member of Film Use Management Board. I would like to briefly summarize all the wonderful presentations we have heard today. Today's pre-congress that is promoted by the Film EU Alliance had the theme of uh, future visions. Uh, within which we covered the fields of new pedagogies and visual arts. We started by introducing the new European Bauhaus initiative. Mariana raised an interesting question. Can we design our way out of extinction? This is a food for thought. Then we discussed uh, future storytelling, new pedagogies and new forms of creative narrative. Ronan demonstrated how uh, we learn is just as important as what we learn. We found out that an answer he should have given his student uh, five years ago still haunts him. Uh, now that's what I call dedication in a teacher. Uh, following Ronan, Erica demonstrated the best practices in artistic research, uh, which information was gathered within the framework of the Film U Alliance. Finally, before the lunch break, Tobias, uh, Tobias presented uh, methods and challenges in um, teaching transversal projects. Then um, after the break, we moved on to uh, visualizing the impossible and witnessed some amazing animations. Then sound mock-up, and last but not least, measuring the impact of uh, cinema sound effects on audience. By the way, thank you, Jürgen and David, for the wonderful presentations. Uh, this topic is especially close to our hearts at SFA. We intend to research ambisonic, psychoacoustics, and immersive sound more in depth in the future within our alliance. Uh, by all means, I would like to thank CIIA having its eighth inter uh, International Congress of Audiovisual Researchers in Lisbon mm -hmm. tomorrow and the day after for giving us this opportunity of uh, promoting the pre-Congress. I invite everyone to join this interesting Congress starting tomorrow. Uh, the main goal of which is to develop an understanding of the paradigm shift set in motion by information and communication technologies and the production of digital contents. Um, as mentioned earlier, FilmU is one of the new projects promoted by the European Union to support the creation of trans-European universities in the area of film and media arts. Today's pre-Congress aimed to promote debate and reflection on some of the project's um, intervention areas, namely artistic research and pedagogical practices in uh, cinema and audiovisual teaching. If you are interested in finding out more about our future events, Please follow us on social media. You may find us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Finally, uh, I would like to give you information of our future on our future events. Um, the first Film EU Summit will take place from the 21st to the 24th of September in Portugal. And the following year, we will have our forum on the 5th of May at Luca in, in Belgium. 
Thank you for your attention. Uh, we hope to see you next time, perhaps even in person. And now I would like to ask all our presenters to turn on their cameras for the final goodbyes. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.